a service of KIVMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. Here's another in NBC's great parade of new shows. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide. A mad killer is loose in the city. In every instance, he leaves the murder weapon behind. There are no fingerprints, no clues to the killer's identity. Your job, get him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, June 3rd. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was off duty reporting back in on an emergency call. It was 3.57 a.m. when I got to the basement of the city hall. The carpool. Let's go, Friday. Sorry to call you back in. Couldn't be helped. All right, Ben. Okay, Skipper. What's up, Ed? Double murder. When? I don't know. Found out about it oh, 40 minutes ago. You got any ideas? Roughly same M.O. Was that 6413 Norwich, Skipper? No, 6430. What do you mean, the same M.O.? The same guy. Brick that killer. How many does this make? Counting tonight, four. We got anything at all? A smudged fingerprint we can't even classify. Sounds like a smart operator. We gotta get him. We have to shake down the city from one end to the other. Big job, Skipper. Big killer. At 4.26 a.m., we pulled up in front of 6430 Norwich Drive, a small group of bungalow apartments facing on an oval-shaped garden court. Two uniformed officers were stationed at the door to the apartment. Hi, Chief. Hi, fellas. We went inside. Wellbird from Homicide was waiting for us. This way. In here. Well, there they are. Yeah. Mother, daughter. Joe, on the floor beside the bed. Yeah, a red brick. <laughs> Miss Hafters, we know how you must feel about all this, but would you please try to answer a few more questions for us? Yes. All right. Poor Margaret. Miss Hafters, how long have you known Mrs. Diaz and her daughter? Nine years. This November they moved next door. I remember it so well. We got along right from the start. And as far as you know, the only close friends the mother and daughter had live right here in the apartment court? Yes. Margaret was a pretty girl, but she was no chaser, no boyfriend. Very close to her mother. The two of them, very close. Did they keep any amount of valuables in the apartment? Money, jewelry, things like that? Oh, no, Mrs. Diaz and Margaret didn't have much, you know. Very modest income. They both worked. And you can think of no good reason. Oh, no, no. Oh, poor Margaret, poor Mrs. Diaz, lying in there. Shocked. Terrible, sir. Wellberg. Yes, Sergeant. Would you show Miss Hafters back to her apartment? Sure, Sergeant. Thank you, Miss Hafters. We appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Well, Joe, let's check with Ed. He's back in the bedroom. You get anything from the neighbors? Yeah, I 
The usual, Ed. No jealous boyfriends, ex-husbands, nothing like that. Boys find any evidence yet, Skipper? I'm still working on it. You got any theories? Well, we know the killings were all done by the same guy. Mm -hmm. Cuts the same pattern out of the window screen. Cuts the same pattern with a glass cutter out of the window. Reaches in and flips the locks. All right, where's that leave us? And before he gets inside, he makes sure there are only women in the house. That means he probably watches the house for a few days. Yeah. Once he gets inside, he wants only one thing, to kill. He's never taken any valuables. As far as we can tell, he's never searched for any. What kind of a man works like that? I think the guy's kill crazy. Hey, fellas. Yes, Donner? Here's a break. Two fair prints. One thumb, one forefinger. What'd you get, Pete? Only got nine points. Not enough to go into court, but enough to make him. We'll know him when we get him. Yeah. Found the prints on the lens of the old lady's eyeglasses. Probably knocked him off the night table when he went after her. And when he was done, he put him back on the table. Yeah. Had blood on his hands, see? Yeah. That's funny, isn't it? Why would he go to the trouble of picking up the woman's glasses after he killed her? We'll ask him when we find him. Hi, Ben. Joe. I have something for you. We can use it, Lee. Hold it just a minute. Yeah. Crime lab, Jones. Yeah. Yeah, all right. I'll tell him. Right, Ed. Backstrand. If you're through checking the victim's clothes by 8 o'clock, you can knock off for sleep until noon. What if we're not through? Take it up with the chaplain. Here's what I wanted to show you. Over here. A couple of casts. Bare footprints. That's right. Those from the Diaz place? Found them outside the dining room window in the flower bed. Take a look. Mm Mm-hmm. Good cast. Size 9. 10. Uh, Missing toe there, huh? Left foot, first toe. That's lucky. Well, the guy took his shoes off before he went in that house. That's the way it looks. You leave any other prints, Lee? Three, with the shoes on. Here they are, here. Yeah. How would you say the guy is built, Lee? Oh, from the impression, pretty heavy man. There's no full length of stride, or I might give you an idea of his height. How about the bricks, Lee? Here they are, all three of them. Use this one in the first murder, this one in the second, this one last night. Leaves them around like calling cards, and there's no way to check them. You'll never get a fingerprint off a common red brick like this, Ben. Surface is too rough. Well, we got an idea of his weight. We know that the first toe's missing from his left foot. That's something. The one we had yesterday. We can check that missing toe in the amputation file, Joe. Yeah. Well, we better get back. Pete ought to have those prints ready, too. Thanks a lot, Lee. Okay, fellas. Say, they post the bodies yet? Yeah, they're doing it now. Same as the first two. The brain? Concussion, hemorrhage. They didn't have a chance. Hold it a minute. Crime lab, Jones. Sure, just a minute. Either one of you, fellas. I'll get it, Joe. Okay. Yeah, Romero. Yeah. Good, we'll be right over. They got a make on those two fingerprints. Okay, Joe. Single print file. Made him on the index finger. Let me see, Pete. Uh-huh. Take a look, Ben. Yeah. Doesn't look like a killer, does he, Joe? Kind of nice looking. That's right, Pete. They said the same thing about John Dillinger. The name at the top of the make sheet read Carlos Richard Monterey. Male, Caucasian, age 19, height 5 feet 11 inches, weight 165 pounds, dark brown hair, dark brown eyes. Last known address... 1663 Naples Street, Los Angeles. Previous arrests, one, auto theft, February 8th, 1936. That was all. Ben and I had been expecting more. The information on the mama sheet for Monterey was 13 years old. So was the picture. So was the description. So was the address. In 13 years, a man can change in a thousand ways. So can his habits, his appearance, his address. In 13 years, everything can change except two things. A man's fingerprints and a physical deformity. (laughs) Missing toe on left foot. Carlos Richard Monterey. Here it is, Joe. 1663 Naples. Yeah, come on. Somebody's coming. Mm-hmm. Yes? What is it? 
We're police officers. We'd like to ask you a few questions. Oh, yes. Uh, would you like to come in? Thank you, ma'am. Yes? Would you mind telling us your name? Monterey. Isabel Monterey. What is it you want? You're married? Yes. My husband is Francisco Monterey. Would you explain why you are here? We thought you might be able to help us. We're looking for a man named Carlos Monterey. I don't understand you. We're looking for a man. We'd like to talk to him. Do you know where he is? Yes. Carlos is dead seven years ago. He's dead. My husband told me. And does your husband know Carlos, or did he know him? He was his brother. What about your husband's parents, Miss Monterey? Where are they? They're both dead. Sometime now. Have you ever met Carlos? No, never. I have only heard of him. What have you heard of him, Miss Monterey? Do not ask me. This is important, very important. Francisco would not like it if I told you. It's important, Miss Monterey, believe us. Carlos, he's sick. His mind. For eight years, Francisco has not seen him, not heard from him. He thinks he's dead. But he only thinks so, Miss Monterey. No one has told him his brother's dead. He just thinks so. What else is there to think? Where's your husband now? At his work, his store. Rivera Street near Maine. Grocery. Monterey Cartwright Grocery. Here's your change. Thank you, Mrs. Myers. Now, look, officers. You know how it is. You don't like to let these things get out. That's why I trust you. You can trust us, Mr. Monterey. We just want to check on a few things. Oh, fine. Always glad to help out if I can. Well, can you tell us if your brother was ever in a mental institution in his life? Oh, I know. There was nothing wrong. 1923. Got a little bad, so Mom and Dad had to put him away for a while. Just till he calmed down. I remember the day. Sometimes. Dumb, stupid kid. What do he know? Standing there by himself in the train, crying. The public nurse, stupid way he cried. What do you do? I cried too. I was only ten, Sergeant. I, I saw him go. He was alone. Later on, Mr. Monterey, your brother was released from the state institution. Yeah, he was 16. And then he started running around, playing tough, carried a gun, lived by himself. He never came around. He dropped from sight about 1938. You haven't heard from him since then? Nothing. Never seen him. Do you know of anybody who might have seen him? Ooh, there was a girl he had. Uh, Anita something. On Soteo Street. Uh, Anita Martin, yeah, that's it. Soteo Street. Maybe she's seen him. Ask her. Maybe she's seen him. Carlos? Carlos Monterey? Uh, not in a year. Last March she was in. When I was working at the Peacock, down on South Main. He came in, we talked for a while. That was all. And you haven't seen Carlos for the past two months or so? I tell you, no. Has he written to you? Has he phoned you? Mm. Once, three weeks ago, he phoned. Here. He left a message with my girlfriend. But he didn't call back again. Now, that's it. That's all I know. Thank you, Miss Martin. Here's our card. If he does call, well, you'll let us know. Yeah, I'll let you know. You like Carlos. Is that it, Anita? Like him? No, I didn't like him. He was funny. But he was nice. You know, I pitied him. Why did you pity him, Miss Martin? Well, he was a good fellow who was strange. He could smile, you know. He had a nice smile, but you could tell he was never laughing. There was something in his mind. Something. Oh, I don't know. At least a year, closer to two, I haven't seen Carlos. No letters, not a card, nothing. He was in the East the last time I heard. When was that? A year ago, January, I was in here. He sent me a calendar. Sometimes he could get along fine, very well. Other times, terrible. He couldn't keep him down. How'd he manage to stay out of jail that way, Vicente? I don't know. Sometimes he should have been in jail five times over. And you say you don't know of anybody who might have a recent picture of Carlos, a snapshot? No. No, no one I can think of. Okay, Vincent, here's our card. If you do think of somebody, let us know, will you? It'll help. Sure, glad to. If I hear of anybody. What kind of a day is it outside? Hot? Hot. By five o'clock that afternoon, Ben and I were certain of one thing. Carlos Monterey was in the city of Los Angeles, somewhere. 
We drove back to the office and told Ed Backstrand about our interviews with Monterey's relatives and his friends. Inquiries and requests for further identification and information on him were immediately relayed to the state mental institutions. The 13-year-old picture of Monterey taken from the files was copied and distributed with a note of caution as to the age of the photograph. An APB was sent out. Stakeouts were placed at the home of Monterey's brother, at the brother's store, and at the apartment of Anita Martin. A special detail of 300 men was ordered to join the dragnet already in operation. The details at the airport and the bus terminals were alerted, as well as the details at the Union Depot and the main post office. By 6 o'clock that night, almost 1,000 men were actively working at the job of tracking down Carlos Monterey. At 6.30 p.m., Ben and I drew a four-hour relief period. We drove out to Ben's place, and his wife fixed us some dinner. At 10.30 that night, we reported into the office, picked up Ed Backstrand, and we drove out to join the manhunt. Cruised with the dragnet operation until 5 o'clock that morning. Ben and I took turns driving. Actually, the tremendous job of scouring 500 square miles of city for one man was only beginning. Unless there was an unexpected break, the search for Carlos Monterey could wear on for weeks. It did. Night after night, the manhunt went on, and day after day. There was no break. Sixteen days later, on a Sunday night, I went to bed early. I read a while, and then I turned off the lamp and went to sleep. Hello? Friday talking. Sorry, Joe. Get in here as fast as you can. Hmm? What's the matter? That girl Monterey knew. The one you talked to? Yeah? She left her apartment, went to her girlfriend's. Yeah? She's dead. There it is. Ordinary red brick. Found it by the body. How long has she been dead, Skipper? Well, she was seen alive about an hour and a half ago. Got three bare footprints, good length of stride. Found them down in the lot beside the house. What do they look like? Same guy. First toe missing from the left foot. The same weight impression. Should be about five foot eleven. That checks out with what you got, doesn't it? All right, so it's the same guy. What about those shoes we found, Lee? Yeah, they correspond. They were impregnated with foreign matter. What'd you find? Particles of lettuce leaf. Dry onion skin, traces of red cabbage. Maybe a vegetable counter. Maybe. What about the city wholesale market down on Front Street? What about any market in Los Angeles? No, Lee, that wholesale market is big enough to hide anybody. Hundreds of transients work in there. Some of them even sleep there. For a guy like Monterey, it'd be perfect. That's a fair guess. Check it when it opens. They open at 2 a.m. 2.30 now. All right, get back to the office and pick up as many extra men as you need. Get down there right away. Okay, Ed. Now, you know he's a rough one, so watch it. Monday, June 23rd, at two minutes past 3 a.m., we pulled up at the city wholesale produce market. With the exception of 54 police officers in plain clothes who mingled with the buyers and sellers, business went along as usual. The market itself covered almost three square blocks in the lower part of the downtown area. It was divided off into hundreds of individual stalls by flimsy wooden partitions. To make the search even tougher, the place was crowded. For the first 45 minutes, we had the men circulate at random through the crowd on the chance that one of them might spot Carlos Monterey from the 13-year-old picture. It didn't happen. After that, we started the systematic canvas. We talked to the customers. We talked to the managers of the different booths. We gave them Monterey's description. We showed them his picture. Nobody recognized him. We checked the employment records one by one. Not a sign. Sorry, Sergeant. I'd like to help. I've never seen the guy. Okay, Mr. Snyder. Thank you. We sure pick the sweet jobs, don't we? Oh, yeah. We could spend a year at this. Oh, Sergeant. Sergeant Friday. Yeah, Kamansky. Did you find something? Yeah, at the booth over there against the far wall. Thinks he might have hired Monterey a couple of days ago. Come on, Ben. Where? Over there, Sergeant. You sure Monterey's picture? Yeah, he thinks it might be him. Mr. Fresnetti, this is Sergeant Romero, Sergeant Friday. Yes, I call you your boy, Sergeant. This fellow Carlos, I hired him to help uh, last Thursday. Big rush for me now, so I hired him. You sure he's the man? In the picture? I think so. A little older, maybe. Oh, but I know faces. He's the man. You, you're looking for him? You say you hired this man last Thursday. That's right. It's a big rush for me. Now in the morning, I, I hired him Thursday. He worked uh, 
Those are day, Friday, Saturday. But he don't show up this morning, so I got to no use. Too many men to pick it from. He don't show up, I let him go. What kind of work did he do for you? Same as he did for Schiller down there. Eh? Heavy work. Uh, moving the stores, they're cleaning up. What kind of produce does Schiller handle, Mr. Franzinetti? Fancy, very fancy vegetables. Uh, choice. Uh, new potatoes, uh, expensive red onions. Uh, Schiller sells to the big hotels. Does Schiller handle brown onions, Mr. Franzinetti? Oh, only the best. Big dealer at the Schiller. Sells it to the big hotels. How long has this Carlos been working around the market? Oh, I don't know. Is it just the like of the rest? First he worked for me, then uh, Largo Massini, then Schiller. Hey, why are you looking so hard for him? He, he stole somebody? He murdered somebody. Him? Mamma mia, murder. Do you have any idea where Carlos lives? Oh, me? No, no. And if he comes back here, I tell him to get out. I got nothing to do with this trouble. No, you'll tell him nothing, Mr. Presnetti. Here's our card. If you see Monterey again, call us. Say nothing to him. Oh, sure, sure. I bring him. Uh, Joe, call the chief at the office, will you? Message just came in. Thanks, Al. Come on, Ben. Yeah, there's a phone booth. See? No, I don't. Where? Straight ahead, little to the left. Oh, yeah. You got a nickel? Mm, let's see. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there you are. Thanks. I'll see what Ed wants. Two five one one. Two five one one. Chief of detectives always had him. Hi, Mike. Ed there. Ed, take it on extension two, will you? Backstrand talking. Friday, Ed. Move fast on this one, Joe. What's up? Main post office. Carlos Monterey picked up a letter there less than five minutes ago. Come on, Ben. There's Ed over there with Welberg. Yeah. Traffic short jammed up around here. Hi, Ed. Friday, Romero. You all set, Wilbur? All set, Chief. Spring Street to San Pedro. Sunset the first. Got it covered. Good. What's the story? Post office detail tipped us off. Five minutes after eight, a man answering Carlos Monterey's description picked up a letter at the general delivery window. That was 16 minutes ago. Who spotted him? Sam Lane. Got a look at him just as he was leaving the window. Called to him to stop, but Monterey ran. Lane called me, and we threw a net over the area for six blocks around. And Monterey's still somewhere inside this area? I don't know how he could have gotten out. What's next? Well, I'll give him an hour to break for it. After that, we start a house-to-house search of the whole area. Stop all pedestrian and vehicular traffic for identification. You're going to jam up the depot traffic. That's cheaper than murder, Romero. Get going. The first hour, we counted off in five-minute segments. Like Backstrand, we felt close enough to Monterey to touch him. But he still wasn't there. The north and south ends of the blockade started to move in, slowly, searching every store, every house, every conceivable place where a man might hide out. In the meantime, Ben and I worked the Spring Street side of the blockade, watching the faces of the pedestrians as they came through, one by one, examining all vehicles and their drivers. The morning wore on, the sun came out, and it started to get warm. By 11 o'clock that morning, Monterey still had not been found. The temperature was 93 in Los Angeles. We're still climbing. The search went on. At ten minutes past two p.m., Backstrand made the round. How's it look, Skipper? Not good. Going slow. How much longer you figure? Oh, I don't know. It'll go to after dark, that's sure. District down here is like a rat's nest. Yeah. Nothing? Nothing. But he's someplace inside this blockade. He's got to be. Any chance of getting relief for the men in our squad? Some of them been working straight through since yesterday. Uh, I'll see. Check with me around five this afternoon. Thank you, Skipper. Keep a sharp lookout. One slip. That's all it takes. The search went on. At three o'clock that afternoon, the temperature was 95. We sweltered and we waited. At 345, Backstrand sent a squad of men into the Union Depot to search it from top to bottom. There was one false alarm when one of the men thought he saw Monterey slipping out a side door into a taxi. He turned out to be a train conductor. At 25 minutes past four, Backstrand passed along the order to our detail to start moving in, house by house. It was a tedious job, and it went slow. The men were tired. At 5.30, the relief squad showed up. Ben and I stayed on. After another two hours of house-to-house searching, the trap was narrowed down to a three-square-block area, a single block wide and three blocks long. It started to get dark. Backstrand ordered out batteries of floodlights. By 8 p.m., the cordon closed in around the last two square blocks. Lines are all set, Skipper. Ready to move. Good. What do you think? Well, we'll know pretty soon, one way or the other. Frank, keep that traffic moving. All right, you two, get going. See you later, Skipper. 
Joe, let's take a look in here. Okay. Sure is an old building. Yeah. Where'd Kamansky go? I don't know. He's here a minute ago. Oh, wait. There's his flashlight. It's on the end of the corridor there. He's signaling. Yeah, come on. Kamansky? Yes. Down below, Sergeant, in the basement. Come on. Monterey? He's been there, I think. Here, this way. Where? Over here. Now, watch the step. The light's bad. Here he is. Says he's a janitor. Oh, my head. He's been slugged. All right, come on. How'd it happen? Can you tell us? Yeah, a man, a big man, hit me. I came down to empty the baskets. He hit me and ran. Ran over to the new building. The new building? Is that the one next door? Yeah, just a few minutes ago. Nobody's come out of this building for the past half hour. Every door in the place is guarded. No, no, not the doors. He went through the tunnel. I saw him. Over there's the tunnel. I'll take a look, Joe. Mm. Yeah, the tunnel. Connects the two basements. Same company, old building, new building. The tunnel connects the basements. Joe, come on. Yeah. Kamansky, get out the back strand. Tell him what's happened. Right, Sergeant. And call an ambulance. Right. All right, then. Through the tunnel. Watch where you're going. The light's bad. Yeah, it is. That a door up ahead there? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Let's go. Good. There's a stairway. Come on. Watch the doors. Joe, the elevator. They're both on the third floor. Let's head for the stairs. Ben, come on. Well, we'll never make it on the stairs. Joe, look. There's another elevator. The control lever's bent. Let's try it anyway. Yeah. All right, kick the control lever. Kick it, Ben. That's good. All right, Ben, knock the lever back. Come on, quick. Yeah. What's the matter? Joe, it's jammed. We're going fast. All right, let's kick it. Here. Here, yeah, that does it. Can you reach the door control? Wait just a minute. I'll see. Yeah. Okay. Well, he's still in the building. Both elevators are here now. Yeah. Down the hall, Ben. The office on the left, I think. Yeah. Okay, yeah, here we are. All right, keep clear of the door. All right, Monterey, put on that gun and come on out. I'll kill you! I'll kill you! I'll kill you! I'll kill you! Okay, Joe, let's take it. Watch it, Ben. He's throwing everything he can get his hands on. I'll kill you! Come on! Come on! I'll kill you! Get away! I'll kill you! Oh, oh. All right, Monterey. Come on, you. Okay, Ben, take him. Yeah. Oh. Nice looking guy. Clean cut. Yeah. Doesn't figure, does it? What's that? My wife would say he doesn't look like a killer, does he? What's a killer supposed to look like? The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Carlos Monterey was examined by five different psychiatrists appointed by the Superior Court and was found to be sane. He was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. He was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary. You have just heard the 17th in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of W.A. Wharton, acting chief of police, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to motorcycle patrolman John Kramer of the El Paso, Texas Sheriff's Department, who on the afternoon of April 26, 1940, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. You're tuned for the stars on NBC.
The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Another one of those society things. Depends on what you mean by society. Well, you know, Sam, cafe society. Cocktails for two, hands across the table, make it another old fashioned thing. Let's not lose our head, Abby. Uh, nothing but double martinis, very dry, with two olives, sweetheart. Two olives? Mm-hmm. Oh, Sam, isn't that overdoing it? It was all overdone, sweetheart. That's what cracked it. Now, stay right where you are. I'll be right down to mix up my report on the dry martini caper. Get it? <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talent to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. August is always a great vacation month, and for those of you planning to take your vacation soon, let me suggest that when you're packing... Be sure you include a bottle and a handy tube of Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. For no matter where you go, you can always depend on Wild Root Cream Oil to groom your hair neatly and naturally, relieve dryness, and remove loose dandruff. Yes, you can take it with you on your vacation, and you should. Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Oh, Sam. You look sober as an owl. Wise as an owl, sober as a judge, Ed. Oh. Well, the way you talked on the phone, I thought you drowned the shamrock, kissed Ooh. the black betty, spliced the main brace, decorated the mahogany, made a Dutch bargain, or, in the word, gone to give a Chinaman a music lesson. Effie, I wish you'd spend more time with Harper's Bazaar while I'm gone, and less with the thesaurus of slang. Ah. Uh, Didn't know I could say that. Are you sober? Well, I've been riding the choo-choo, <laughs> drinking Adam's ale, and if you don't believe it, just ask me to walk the chalk. Okay, here she tells you. Arms akimbo, eyes blazed. Uh, yes, sir. Now uh, then, uh, tip of the forefinger to the tip of the nose. Oh. Oh, Sam, it makes me dizzy. Dizzy Gillespie? Dizzy go. Oh, Sam. Exactly. And uh, you are not sewn up, shagged, shellacked, shickered, stuckered, tap shackled, stiffo, or real crazy. Well, you know best, Sam. Good. Now try this one. Yes, Chris. Uh, sitting posture, limbs cruciform. What? Cheesecake stop. Oh, Sam. That's it. Now place the notebook. Uh uh-uh, uh, just a little higher. Good. <laughs> now apply the tip of the pencil to the top of the fool's cap and proceed, viz. Viz. Date. August 1st, 1948. To Mrs. Netta Martini, 1000 Marina Boulevard, San Francisco. From Samuel Spade, license number 127596. Subject, Dear Netta. The first I knew of the caper was day before yesterday morning when I saw your husband's picture in the paper. It was one of those lovingly retouched executive type photographs of a man in his late 40s or early 50s, graying at the temples and wearing an embalmed man of distinction look. The story was headlined, Corporation Head Waylaid by Mysterious Assailant. Chauffeur foils would-be kidnappers at offices of Martini Trading Company. The item under it wasn't as thrilling as the headline. Sounded as if he'd been knocked down for his wallet and the attempted kidnapping had been dreamed up by a bored city news reporter. I tossed it in the wastebasket along with my morning mail and went back to the police gazette. On page three, the phone rang. (laughs) Unique garage, Harry speaking. Mr. Spade. One moment, who's calling? Gordon Martini. Not uh, Gordon Martini, the corporation head, waylaid by mysterious assailant. Chairman of the board, and there's nothing mysterious about it. Then what are you doing on this phone? I can't talk on the phone. Where are you? In a hospital? I left that pest house this morning. I'm at my residence, 1000 Marina Boulevard. Mm-hmm. It will take you exactly 20 minutes by cab. You will meet me in front of the building, and we'll have our conference in my car en route to the office. Where's your office? Downtown Post Street. Well, why don't I meet you there? I'm a busy man. I have a full calendar. I'm already late due to all that hospital red tape. But I can fit you into my schedule if you hurry. Now look alive, man. Well, it's a little early in the morning, but I'm trying on. Good. What will you want for a retainer? I'll let you know if I decide to take the job. Fair enough. Twenty minutes. I'll expect you. 
I uh, should have looked more alive. It took me two minutes to get out of the street, one minute to flag down a cab, and 18 minutes to reach your address letter, a total of 21 minutes. As my taxi drew up to the curb in front of the canopy entrance to the corner of Parker House at 1000 Marina, I saw your husband pacing indignantly up and down in front of the entrance, pausing only to glare at the outsized chronometer on his left wrist. His gray Hamburg was perched atop an outsized turban of gauze bandage that decorated his head. Ah, now you're space. You're exactly one minute and uh, 22 seconds late. Hours are made of minutes, minutes are made of seconds. In killing this seemingly negligible interval of time, you have wounded an hour. Oh, I have. Well, I'm sorry. The uh, traffic's pretty heavy out here this hour of the morning, you know. You should have started a minute and 22 seconds earlier. I'm sorry there was a bore on the telephone kept talking about how valuable his time was. Yeah, well, don't apologize. Only waste more time. Now, here's your check, $100. My car's just around the corner. I paid that chauffeur a large salary. We mustn't keep him waiting. In the meantime, you may as well start earning your fee. I've been earning it for the past uh, 22 minutes and 22 seconds. Right. Uh-huh. I suspected as much. Do you drive a car? Yeah, you mean uh, one man drives all that? Uh, I see him, that rascally chauffeur of mine. Sleep in the back seat. All right, come out of there, you. Hey, hey, what? I was behind him and a little to the right. The shock of the rapid fire, 30 caliber slugs, lifted him off his feet and knocked him against me. I went down under his 300 pounds of dead weight. By the time I rolled him off of me and got up, the gunman had jumped out of the limousine and into a gray sedan that was double parked alongside. In the welter of traffic on the boulevard, I didn't dare risk throwing a shot after him, but I did get the first three numbers of the license plate before it buried itself in a heavy stream of AM commuters. That's when the air changed from exhaust fumes to something out of a Persian garden. I turned and looked for the first time into your Nile green eyes, Netta saw you twisting a handkerchief in your pale hands I might have loved beside the Shalimar, but on Marina Boulevard, they looked like hysterics dead ahead. Who, who did it? You saw him. Don't lie to me. Why don't they come with me? Oh, all those people standing around the stairs. Make them go Stop away. Make them go away. I can't stand it. No, stop it, will you? That's better. Now, come on over here. Who are you? His wife? Yes. And it was all my fault. This is the end. I called Ernie out the window and asked him to come upstairs. I, I wanted him to return some lingerie. They sent the wrong color, Pete. Yeah, yeah. Who's Ernie? He's our chauffeur. I was looking for the exchange slip when we heard the shots. Is he dead this time? Yeah. Don't go to pieces. Poor Gordon. He had so many enemies. He didn't drink well, you know. People dropped us like flies. Well, they certainly dropped your husband. Are you a policeman? No, but I'll do until the real thing comes along, which is right now. If I were you, lady, I'd uh, go back upstairs and relax. They'll get to you soon enough. Yes, I suppose you're right. Poor Gordon, he looks so natural stretched out on the pavement. Yeah. I, I keep thinking he'll get up and stagger on into the elevator. He didn't drink at all well. Go on, will you? All right, I'm going. Oh, Ernie, where did you go? Down at the garage. I, I heard a car driving. Poor Mr. Martini, it, it's all my fault. Oh, no, Ernie, it's mine. If I only hadn't misled that change slip. What? You know, when I called you out the window to come and get that package. Oh, oh, that. What do we got here? Who's the witness? Me. Oh, Spade. Lost another client, huh? Not quite. I hadn't cashed the check yet. Well, they got him anyway. All right, pull the space in there. Let him throw that stretcher. All right, Step over here out of the crowd, Sam. I want to get this stage. Hey, yeah. All right, out of the way, please. Okay, Jerry, take it down. Got a pencil? Yeah, and I want it back. Let's have it. This guy is Gordon Martini. Mm -hmm. He headed up a local firm, the Martini Trading Company. Mm -hmm. Last night he was working late at his office. Got boinged. All right. Phoned me this morning. Didn't know why. Thought maybe he wanted a bodyguard. Anyway, he needed one. Mm -hmm. Gunman was uh, crouched in the back seat of the limousine, shoved the carbine out when Martini opened the door. Carbine. Mm -hmm. Didn't get a good look at him. You can see why. The way it's closed there, no side windows. Mm -hmm. Foreign car, isn't it? Stop drooling. You can't afford one. You getting all this? What about the getaway? Martini fell on top of me. I saw the getaway car in the back of his head. Yeah. The car was a gray sedan. In the back of his head was a standard make, too. Only got the first three digits of license plate, uh, 5D9. 5D9. Anything else? Yeah, give me back my pencil. The homicide boys want some help. They know my fee. Mr. Fade. This is Martini. Why aren't you and Ernie upstairs getting your alibis shaped up? Oh, please, I, I can't face the questions just yet. Would it be legal if I just avoided them until I can collect myself? I don't know about legal, but it might be smart. Where can we talk? What do you suggest? Well, there's a little cocktail lounge up on Lombard where Ernie and I all... Uh, I mean, well, it's, it's just around the corner. Very handy. Let's go. Well, 
against my mother's advice, I should have listened. But, well, that's why I married Mr. Martinez. Well, uh, that place is up to 1943, and it's only, uh, quarter of 12. You're just like him. Always holding a stopwatch over my head. Always? Well, he drank, you know. You told me that. But it's much more important than you think. He often fell down and bumped his head. You mean that mysterious assailant that waylaid him last night in his office was a double martini? Two pitchers full before dinner. Three. And he had to carry him up to his office. Well, what did he go up there for? Oh, he had an appointment with the vice president of the firm, Mr. Nesbitt. Something had come up and he wanted Gordon to sign some papers. I don't know what. It wasn't the first time. I waited outside in the car. After Ernie had taken him upstairs, he came back to the car and we talked. Mm Oh, Ernie has alibis upstairs, downstairs, and all around the house. Well, then when the others came out and Gordon didn't, Ernie went upstairs to see why. Others? Mr. Nesbitt and who else? Mary Callahan. Secretary? No, she's an attorney. And if you think everything was legal between those two, well, <laughs> but after all, who am I to call the oh. kettle black? Now, what are you trying to tell me? That he got him drunk so they could make him sign some papers? That he got himself drunk so he couldn't write his name? Or that he just got drunk and fell down? Between you and me, I think she pushed him down a flight of stairs. In his condition, he never remembered. Why are you putting a finger on the Callahan day? Well, what would you think? She was the last one out of the building. Why didn't you want to tell all this to the police? Well, I didn't want to talk about his drinking. Things were bad enough already. That would have been the end. Oh, well, that's as good an answer as any. What do you want me to do for you? Prove that she did it and Ernie didn't. I'll let you take care of Ernie. Oh, no. I don't want to alibi him unless I have to. He might get the wrong idea. You mean I've got the wrong idea? He might think it meant I still care for him and I don't. I can't stand him anymore. The way he chews those toothpicks. <coughs> and besides, if his alibi is too good, I might have trouble about that car being in the back seat of my car. Pardon me, it sounded as if you said you might have trouble about a car being in the back seat of your car. That's what I said. Where is your car? In the garage. But somebody had it out this morning. They, they scraped the fender coming back in and they ran into the wall. They must have been in an awful hurry. Tell me, this car of yours, it wouldn't be uh, a gray sedan? Yes. License number? Oh, wait a minute. It's on my key ring. Uh, here, 5D90. That's enough. Why didn't you tell me this before? Well, I, I couldn't get up the nerve. After I heard you tell that policeman the gun that killed Gordon was a carbine and the gray sedan and all that, well, it's the end. I hoped you were right, but I didn't think so. When I went to look at the gray sedan in your garage, I knew you were wrong, dead wrong. It was the getaway car, all right, and the carbine, as you know, was proven later to be the one that killed your husband. But Ernie had turned into a very poor suspect indeed. He was hugging the carpet between the front and the rear seats, and when I nudged him, he didn't move. He'd been shot at closer range than Gordon Martini, and the killer had used only one slug. It was planted in the base of his brain, which made him not only a very poor suspect, but a very dead one. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the dry martini caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Martini Trading Company, good afternoon. I'm sorry, Mr. Nesbitt is in conference. I'll see that he gets your message. Well, what can I do for you? I, uh, would like to see Miss Callahan. Miss Callahan is in conference with Mr. Nesbitt. Good. I would like to see them both. 
But I have orders not to disturb them. You do not have to. I will. Just a minute. You can't go breaking in like that. Yes, and I'll tell you something else. You won't ever get away with it. Why, everyone in this town knows about your underworld connection. Why, you doddering old fool, when I get through with you, if you don't go to the gas chamber for Gordon Martini's murder, you wish you Come had. Up. If I go to the gas chamber, it'll be for killing you, not Gordon. Oh, you said it. Oh, why didn't I have witnesses here? <laughs> Miss Callahan? Oh. Did you hear that? Uh, you weren't talking loud enough. I didn't hear a thing. Well, come on in here and I'll tell you a thing or two. Uh, close that door. Now, sit down. Thanks. I listen better on my feet. Oh, so you're the detective Netta Martini employed, eh? Uh, what's she paying you? That'll depend on how much I have to do for it. Well, I'll tell you how much you'll have to do for it. You'll have to make a case against me, and that's not going to be easy. Uh, why do you think she's out to get you? Why, indeed. <laughs> For years, this moth-eaten mouthpiece, this parboiled Porsche, has been victimizing poor Gordon, taking advantage of his weakness for drugs. Now that she's liquidated him, she appears with 55% of the common stock. (laughs) Motive in that bag. Why, you fraudulent old fool. I simply bought up his debts and threw an attachment on those stocks. Unethical, but perfectly legal. Uh, But uh, you're not even a proper thief. You're nothing but a bumbling old embezzler. Now, look here. You had to that he was going to call in the auditors and look over those books of yours. The dean of double entry, Mr. Spade. Look, look. Will you save this for the courtroom scene? Now, you've convinced me. You're both crooked. I'll see that you both go up for something. That's a promise. Oh, Mr. Spade, I gave you credit for better sense. Do you know that this Medusa of the magistrate's court, this copy of the Hall of Justice, what? tricked him into changing the beneficiary of his insurance the very night she pushed him down the stairs? And you were all in favor of it when you thought you held a controlling interest in the company. Answer that. Uh, Mr. Spade, he can't answer that. Good, good. I'm glad one of you is temporarily lost for words. Now, I only want to know one thing, and I want a straight answer. And if either one of you starts off on another speech, I'm going to push you into the nearest cloakroom and lock you in together. Why, you wouldn't dare. Try me, sweetheart. Uh, well, uh, what do you want to know about this Amazon ambulance chaser? This will be of the traffic court. Uh, 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 uh. Watch it. Well, what do you want to know? About Martini's insurance policy. Now, you say he changed the beneficiary. Please answer in ten words or less. Who was the beneficiary, and who is the beneficiary now? I'll have to answer that question in two parts. The beneficiary was his wife. He changed it to the Martini Trading Company, a corporation of the state of California. Thank you, and goodbye, Mary Callahan. And that nutter took the heat off of you for the time being, which made things tough for me. Because Callahan and Nesbitt were so horrible, I never wanted to see them again, even to testify against them in court. I was sure of one thing. None of you had pulled the trigger of that carbine. There'd been a hired killer behind it, and the way he operated, taking crazy chances in broad daylight in a crowded street, told me an important thing about it. That night, I made the rounds of the joints. At a plant called the Bing Room, I found a bouncer who'd... Tossed out a customer that ran up a bill and tried to pay it with a thousand dollar check. He sent me to the Atlas Hotel. The Atlas Hotel is off of Third Street, down near the railroad yards. Not even a flea bag. The fleas sickened and died a long time ago. They couldn't take it. And from the look of the guests sprawled out in the mission furniture of the lobby, they wouldn't be able to much longer. A half-dead room clerk came back to the land of the living long enough to mutter a room number and wave me feebly toward a flight of crummy stairs. Yeah, what do you want? You, uh, Hack Hartman? Hey, you got anything for me, huh? Yeah, I got news for you. Get back in the room. I'll tell you all about it. Yeah. Well, come on in. Drop the shiv. Yeah, I'll drop it. I'll fix you. I'll cut you good. I'll cut you. I'll cut you. I'm glad you did that. You make it easy for me. Now get over there. Uh, uh, leave me alone. Leave me alone. Huh? I'm not feeling so good. You can feel a lot worse. Who hired you to put the burn on Martini? Uh, you don't get nothing out of me. Who gave you that check? Uh, leave me alone. Uh, I got all night, Hack, and I feel better than you do. Now, what did you do with that check? I'll shake it if your teeth come out with it. Come on. Uh, uh, all right, all right. Stop it, stop it. I, I don't feel so good. Okay. Uh, Where? Pocket. My shirt. Don't reach. I'll get it. Right. It was a company check, which is what I'd expected. It was for a thousand dollars drawn on the Golden Gate Trust and Loan. But I wasn't expecting to find the signature on the bottom line. It was signed in a bold, firm hand, Gordon Martini. Who was the penman on this? He wrote it himself. Right in front of me. What was it supposed to be for? Uh, he, 
He wanted I should knock off his brother. You get mixed up? Well, he's dead, ain't he? That's what I mean. Gordon Martini's dead. Ah, the papers got it wrong. That was his brother, his twin brother. And that other guy, that chauffeur, kept hanging around the garage so I couldn't get out. I had to, I had to burn him, too. You know what you're saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm making sense. Now get out of here. I'm getting steamed. Don't let it worry. Yeah, I got a nice, cool place all picked out for you. After I turned Hack over to the cops, I did what checking I could on my own at that time of night. As nearly as I could learn, Gordon Martini could never have had a brother, twin or otherwise. He was the first child, his mother died in childbirth, and his father died one month later. So I went back to the offices of the Martini Trading Company, glass-keyed my way in, and made a quick frisk of it. There I learned that the signature on the check was indeed Gordon's, but that he had closed out his account at that bank the day he wrote it. I thought about that on the way out to your apartment. Sam, I've been calling and calling, trying to reach you. I've been so worried. It's the end. This time you might be right. Fix me a drink. Well, there's nothing in the house for those prepared martinis Gordon used to drink. Is that all right? No, but fix me one anyway. Never mind the ice. It's not morning yet, but I hate myself already. Why don't you just relax and let me get it for you? I'll relax. You get the martinis. What do you think of Mary Callahan? Isn't she the end? She's cute. You're all cute. All of me? On ice. I'd put ice in anyway. It's nasty without. It's nasty anyway. <laughs> I hope it doesn't make you fall down the way it did poor Gordon. Thanks. <clears throat> what? Well, what's the matter? Too dry? You open this bottle fresh? Why, yes. What's the matter? Where are they? The rest of the bottles. Oh, yeah. More of the same. Is this all your husband ever drank? Yes, gallons of it. It's a special brand. He even took it with him to bars and people's houses. He'd sit and drink them right out of the bottle like a little child. Then he'd be falling down drunk, of course. And that's how we lost so many friends. They dropped us like, like... Like flies. Yeah, it was the end. Who are you phoning? City morgue. Uh, Maxie, Sam Spade. Sammy, what can I do on you? On, uh, Martini, Maxie. Uh, they got around the autopsy yet? Yeah, they rushed them through. Got the report handy? Right in front of me. Funny thing, Sam. The doc said they should have saved themselves the trouble. He'd have been dead in a week or two without no help. What from? Brain tumor. Malignant, it says here. Any alcohol in him? None from drinking, Sammy. Uh, what about the head wounds? Accidental fall due to periodic fainting spell. Part of his condition. Thanks, Maxie. Well, what is it, Sam? Was the martinis poison? No, sweetheart. The martinis were colored water. Why, they couldn't. Well, what made him get so drunk? He didn't. He was sick. But, Sam, who killed him? He killed himself. But he couldn't have. He hired a gunman to do it. He planned his own murder. But that... What? Well, well, why didn't he leave a note or something? He could have ruined us all. Come here, sweetheart. Put your little hand on Uncle Sam's shoulder. What, Sam? That's, uh, just what he wanted you to do. He wanted to ruin you. He let Mary Callahan fleece him out of his interest in the company. He let Nesbitt juggle the books. He let you go your way with Ernie. Let all three of you fix yourselves up with as nice a set of motives for murder as a jury could ask for. Oh, it couldn't have. The real joker was the check he used to pay off the man he hired to kill him. It bounced. It also proved he'd planned his own murder. But he still has his revenge. Because the insurance that would have kept the corporation from going broke won't be paid off on account of a self-liquidating cause. Oh, Sam, darling, what's going to become of us all? Well, uh, Callahan and Nesbitt will probably sue each other to death. You might have to go to work and earn a living. Well, I have $500. I might invest it in something. You already have. Here's my bill. But, Sam, you didn't help me. What? This is the end. No, it isn't, sweetheart. This is the beginning. Come here. Period, uh... End of the end. Well, you asked me. You helped her. Now, F. Well, that just goes to show you. Show what, F? Man's ingratitude to man. Hmm? But what did Mr. Martini have against you? Why, uh, nothing, sweetheart. He, uh, just needed a smart operator like, uh, well, no, Johnny Madero was under. Sam. Hmm? Have you cashed that check Mr. Martini gave you? Well, uh, 
Not yet. I, uh... Sam, any bartender would know better than to take a check from a man who... who drinks that much? F, you haven't been paying attention. He didn't drink. He didn't. I was able to establish that later on. You haven't been listening. time, Sam, for all anybody knew. He was a hopeless drunk. He was, Sam. Oh, you're so wonderful and trusting. But I do wish that you'd understand this. He was a hopeless drunk. For the last time, Effie, he didn't really drink. I'll just type this up, Sam, while you call the bank. I'll do that. A final reminder, friends. Whether you're going on a long vacation trip or just a weekend to the beach, be sure you've got a bottle and tube of Wild Root Cream Oil tucked away in your suitcase. Do this, and you'll find it's easy and quick to spruce up again after stepping out of the water or off the tennis court. For no matter where or when you use it, Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, removes loose dandruff. So at home and away from home, help yourself to handsome hair with Wild Root Cream Oil. And next time you have a chance, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again... The choice of men who put good grooming first. Well, here it is, Sam. I hope it was worth the price of the paper and carbon. You made carbon copies of that? An unimportant report like that? Oh, it bounced? Well, the estate isn't settled yet. Oh, Sam, you're so wonderful and trusting. Effie, I am not wonderful and trusting. I am a hard-boiled private eye. I know. Just a pity there's no money in it. And I'm also too trusted. Sam. Hmm? Have you ever thought of ceramics? Of what? Ceramics. It takes virtually no capital. All you need is a small furnace and some clay. And if you don't have any talent, you can you can just make ashtrays. Thanks, I already have one. Oh, flower pots are fun. You can pop them on a wheel. And you can pot your hat on and wheel on out of here and also take your furnace and play. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love you when you're so gay and carefree. I am not gay and carefree. I you am a... You are a hard-boiled private eye. <laughs> Good night and sue me for your back salary, sweetheart. <laughs> Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Loreen Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Gil Dowd directed tonight's broadcast in William Spear's absence. Join us again next Sunday for another adventure with Sam Spade, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's not alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with sulalanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keep it all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Ladies and gentlemen... The story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to burglary detail. A gang of hijackers has started to work in your city. Truckloads of valuable merchandise have vanished. The thieves are clever, seem to have a foolproof system. Your job, find them. Dragnet, 
The documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, March 6th. It was windy in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of burglary detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from the record bureau, and it was 5.35 a.m. when I got to room 2A. Interrogation room. Read this to him, Ben. Yeah. 2,600 dozen nylon stockings, 45 bolts of silk, 58 cases imported perfume. Where are you dumping this stuff, LaBelle? That's what we want to know. I told you the truth. I have nothing to do with it. I don't know anything about it. What was this stolen way bill doing in the cab of your truck? How many times do I have to tell you? I don't know. Your fingerprints are all over it. You must have carried it there. I didn't carry it there. Somebody's out to frame me. How many in the hijack gang, Lavelle? I'm not in a hijack game. I told you I don't know. When are you going to let me go? Who's the head of the gang? I don't know any head of the gang. I want to get out of here. You're covering for somebody. I'm not covering for anybody. You take the rap for all this, you're going to have a beard down to your knees by the time you get out. I'm not taking any rap. Then let's have it. Oh, I'm tired. $42,000 worth. You know who took it, you know where it is. They could have disappeared anywhere, on the way from the east to the thousand places. Nothing was missing from those shipments when they came in on the train. Everything was there when they were unloaded at the warehouse. Then I don't know, I don't know. Every dollar's worth was accounted for when it was loaded on the truck. Well, where is it now? I'm tired. We've been here all night. Let me... Well, let me read it for you again. 2,600 dozen nylon stockings, 45 bolts of silk, 58 cases imported perfume. And you're trying to tell us somebody hijacked all that from the trucks without you knowing it? The trucks were loaded at the warehouse. We went out to eat. We came back, got in the trucks, delivered the stuff, and that's all I know. And while you were out eating, the receipts for the load disappeared, too. Is that right, Lavelle? I don't know where the way bills are. The shipping clerk, that's his job. We talked to him. He says one of you could have taken the way. Well, then he's lying. I didn't take him. Then what was this way bill doing in the cab of your truck? I told you, I don't know. Somebody's trying to frame me. Why? I don't know. Somebody, I don't know why. Then you better come up with an answer, mister. Look, I'm tired. We've been here since six o'clock last night. We're all tired. Who are you covering for? What are you trying to build? I need that coffee left, Ben. It's cold. That's all right. You want some, Laval? No. All right, now, look, let's get one thing straight. We've been here all night. We can be here all day, tomorrow, the day after that, and the day after that. Yeah. we got enough to make you on this. You know that. We're going to stay with you to tell us the truth. Everything. I've told you all I'm going to tell you. If we stay here for six months, you got it all. This is your home phone, Hillside 8321. That's right, 8321. What time's your wife get up, Lavelle? What do you mean? Ben, get an outside line. Yeah. You're not going to call my home. It's Hillside 8321, Ben. Outside, please. Don't do that. Don't. Not my wife. Please. All right. Ask the questions again. This time I'll give you the answers. Thomas Laval was 38 years old. He was a well-respected man in his community. Sometimes it's like that. You can question a man for hours and he'll never give you any information. But somewhere in every man's makeup, there's a weak point. We were lucky enough to find Laval's. He told us that he would give us the locations where the hijacked goods were hidden. He told us the addresses were written on the ledge of a window cell on the seventh floor of the Teamsters Union Hall. It was 8.30 a.m. On the seventh floor, is that right? Yeah. Do me a favor. Don't make it too big. Well, look, we have to walk through the hiring hall before we get to the elevators in the back. Yeah? These handcuffs... They'll see them, all the guys in the hall. They know me. Can't you take them off my wrist till we get in the elevator? Sorry, LaVelle. Well, I won't try anything, but don't make me walk in front of them with these on. Sorry. Just till we get in the elevator. Can't you do that? I, I don't want the guys to see me. Well, 
here's my overcoat, Lavallo. Drape it over your hands here, and they won't see the cuffs. There you are. Come on. Hi, Tom. How are you? Hi. What's new, Tom? Not much. Let's take the elevator. Yeah. Cigarette? No, thanks. You? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. It's down this way. Uh, let me show you. To the left. A uh, window up ahead there. Yeah, this one. I don't see anything on the windowsill. It's on the outside. Open the window and let me check. Yeah. Let me see here. Ben, grab him. He's trying to jump. Hey, get back here. Get back. I told you. Here. I beat Joe. Get him, Joe. I can't hold him. He's pointing me out. Hold on, Ben. Grab me. Joe. Joe. He's slipping. Try, Joe. Hold on. He's kicking loose. I can't hold him. Hold him, Joe. Ben. Almost went with him. Let's get downstairs. What happened? Call an ambulance. There's been an accident. Thomas Laval was 38 years old. He was a well respected man in this community. He died with the same reputation. We had a prisoner who'd met his death while in our custody. In cases like this, we had to have witnesses. By the time we got to the street, the usual accident crowd had gathered. Anybody here see the accident? What do you want, witnesses? Yeah. Did you see it? Yeah, we saw it. Let's get their names, Ben. My name's Pete Garfield. This is Jack Morris. We'll be your witnesses. You'll probably be subpoenaed for the inquest tomorrow morning. Sure, we'll be there. We saw you push the guy out the window. We saw you kill him. The next morning at 10 a.m. in the basement of the Hall of Justice, Harold J. Lane, deputy coroner, city and county of Los Angeles, read the report of the findings of the autopsy on the body of the deceased Thomas Laval. As is customary at a coroner's inquest, the identification witness was called to testify first. Elizabeth Laval, please. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall help you, God? Yes. Be seated. State your name. Elizabeth Laval. What is your address? 1216 East Camarillo Drive. What is your occupation? I'm a housewife. What is your relation to the deceased? His wife. Have you viewed the body of the deceased in this office? Yes. Who was the deceased? Husband. Thomas Laval. Is there anything further you wish to add? Thank you. Step down, please. Joseph Friday. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth will help you, God? I do. Be seated. State your name. Joe Friday. What is your address? 4656 Collis Avenue. What is your occupation? I'm a police officer in and for the city of Los Angeles. Are you the investigating and arresting officer on this case? I am. Will you state briefly the facts relating to the death of the deceased? <clears throat> on the morning following the arrest by us of the deceased on suspicion of grand theft merchandise, he expressed a desire to assist us in the apprehension of suspects involved in these thefts and the recovery of property taken in them. Did he assist you? Well, he informed us that if we took him to the Teamsters Union Hall, that he'd be able to obtain addresses of the locations where the stolen property was cached. You then took him there? Yes, we did. What happened? When we arrived, he requested us to remove his handcuffs. We refused. The deceased then informed us that the addresses were written on a window ledge on the seventh floor. When we arrived at the window, under the pretense of searching for the addresses, he threw himself over the ledge. I grabbed his left leg to restrain him, but he kicked loose. Uh, 
Did you at any time have any idea that the deceased planned such action? I did not. What did you do then? We immediately went to the location of the body and had an ambulance dispatched. Do you have anything further to state? No, I have not. Are there any questions from the jury? That's all, Officer Friday. Step down. Peter Garfield. Raise your right hand. Yeah. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yeah. Be seated. State your name. Pete Garfield. What is your address? 1654 North Pico. What is your occupation? Truck driver. Down at General Warehouse. Did you know the deceased? Yeah. How did you know him? I worked with him. And that cop's a liar, and so is his buddy sitting over there. Please confine the testimony of this inquest to facts. Were you present at the time the deceased met his death? I told you I was. And those two cops pushed Tom out of the window. Where were you at the time the deceased was pushed or jumped from the window? Jack and I just left the union hall. We were going out the front door when it happened. What attracted your attention? I heard him scream. When I looked up, Tom was falling. That cop was standing at the window watching him. Did you see the officer push him? Yes, I saw him. Did I understand you to say you were on the street outside the building at the time? Yeah. And you saw the officers push the deceased from the window on the seventh floor from your vantage point? Yeah. Isn't it true that that's a physical impossibility? What is? That you could have seen what you testified to from where you were standing. I know they pushed him. You know or you saw? I know that's so. Tom wouldn't jump out of a window. Then it's true... You didn't see the officers push the deceased out of the window? No, I didn't see them. Is there anything further you'd like to add? They must have pushed them. Any question from the jury? That's all, Garfield. Step down. Dorothy River? Raise your right hand. Yes, sir. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do. Be seated. State your name. Dorothy River. What is your address? 211 South Beverly Drive. And what is your occupation? I'm a stenographer at the Teamsters Union Hall. Were you present the morning the deceased met his death? I was. State where you were and what you were doing. I was in our office on the seventh floor doing some filing. Please state what you witnessed. The filing cabinet in our office is by the door. The office faces on the hallway and the door happened to be open. I heard a commotion and looked out. I saw those two officers struggling with the man. Did you hear any conversation? Yes. I heard that officer there say, Get back here, get back. The man outside the window yelled, Let me go, let me go. This officer here, Officer Friday, said, he's pulling me out. Hold on, Ben, grab me. How far from the window were you? I'd say about 15 feet. Do you have anything else to add? Yes. As the two policemen started downstairs, Officer Friday said to me, call an ambulance, there's been an accident. Thank you, Miss River. Those officers didn't push that man out the window. They were trying to hold him. After hearing additional witnesses, the coroner's jury retired at 11.57 a.m. Eight minutes later, they returned with their decision. The deceased met his death voluntarily and by his own actions. The homicide detail continued the investigation of Laval's death. A week went by. With homicide working one side, we hoped that they might turn up additional leads in the hijacking case. Nothing turned up. It seemed that with the death of Thomas Laval, our leads came to an abrupt stop. On Tuesday morning, March 16th at 9 a.m., we got a call from Chief of Detective Zed Backstrand. Now, once more, what about the way bills on these shipments? You checked them? Everything we could. Talk to everybody at Hannah. And talk to them some more. $42,000 in merchandise doesn't just disappear. Now, who's the last one to handle those way bills? The warehouse shipping clerk. The bills were signed and stamped two hours after he filed them in his desk. They disappeared. What about the truck drivers? You checked them out? Talked to all of them. Nothing so far. Nothing was missing from those shipments until they left the warehouse. Is that right? Yeah. 
And somewhere in between the warehouse and the delivery points, $42,000 worth of goods disappeared. Somebody's got to be hijacking those loads. We know that, but how do we get to it? Maybe they're working alone. Maybe they're working with the truck drivers. It's one or the other. It's got to be. We just hadn't lost Laval. Well, you lost him. That doesn't close the case. You got a suggestion? Yeah, I got a suggestion. Crack it. You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories from official police files. And now, an important announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, we are pleased to announce that starting next Thursday, October 6th, Dragnet will be brought to you by Fatima Cigarettes. We'd like to take this opportunity to thank you, the listener, for your excellent response to our efforts in bringing you these weekly authentic presentations of actual cases from official files. Your letters are the only indications we have that Dragnet is a source of your listening pleasure. We'd like to hear from all of you. Starting next Thursday, October 6th, over most of these same NBC stations, Dragnet will be heard weekly at 10.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, immediately following the Supper Club. Check your newspaper for local release time. We stayed on the job. Another week went by. No leads. We spent so much time at the general warehouse where the merchandise disappeared that we almost got to be a part of the crew. We got to know everybody. We made frequent visits to the Teamsters Union Hall. It got us nothing. On Wednesday, March 26th, we reported in for work at 8 a.m. Friday, Romero. Yes, Skipper? You fooled around just long enough. They hijacked another load last night. $38,000. What outfit? Same. General warehouse. Who's your contact down there? Ray Hobart, ship and clerk. Uh, hop down there right now and get the details. Right, Ed. There are two ways to solve this thing. Yeah? You can get those hijackers now or wait till General Warehouse goes out of business. Get on it. Hobart, who was the shipping clerk on duty last night? I was. Uh, working for Siggy. Siegelmeister. He's out of the cold. And you saw the stuff was loaded on the trucks and you checked the way bill. Uh, as usual. Everything as usual. Uh, checked the trucks out at 2 a.m., went back to the office, filed the way bills. You work a pretty heavy schedule, Hobart. You started at 2 a.m. and you're still on duty? Oh, it took the last four hours of Siggy's shift at 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. He had a cold. I was back here at 10 this morning to start my own shift. When did you find out the way bills were missing on that shipment last night? Oh, uh, just before I went off. Maybe uh, half past five, quarter to six. Well, how about the truck drivers who handled that load, Hobart? You got them? Uh... Let's see. I got it right here. Okay. Oh, uh, here you go, Sergeant. Uh, Jack Morris and Pete Garfield. Jack Morris and Pete Garfield were brought in for questioning. We double-checked with Homicide and found that their reports on Morris and Garfield tallied with ours. No previous records. Both men had been tailed for a reasonable length of time since their testimony at the Laval inquest. Their actions failed to implicate them. Four days after the second hijacking, we got a tip from one of our informants down in the warehouse district. He told us that a man in a gray suit had been hanging around the coffee shop next to the Teamsters Union Hall. He was peddling nylon stockings, cheap. There had been other reports like this, which we had followed up, but none of them had paid off. Usually such leads didn't pay off, but we couldn't be sure. They had to be checked. At a few minutes before five that afternoon, we found the nylon salesman in the gray suit in the back booth of the coffee shop adjoining the Union Hall. Look, man. Take a look. The finest. You can't do better. 51 gauge nylon. Look good, huh? Mm, sure do, don't you, Joe? Yeah, they do. We've been looking for you, Max. Some of the guys in the union hall said that you'd be around. Sure, I saw lots of these around the hall. Truck drivers, just like you, buying them like crazy. Good deal. Sure looks like it, man. How many pairs do we have? Many as you want. Four bits a pair, you name it. You got a couple of dozen for us? A couple of dozen? Mm-hmm. No, not on me, but I can get them. Many as you want. Well, we're kind of in a hurry. Can you get them for us fast? A couple of dozen. Better make it three dozen, huh, Joe? Yeah, if you want. Three dozen. Can you get them now? A couple of hours I can get them. Same quality. Want to meet me here? Oh, I don't know. We wanted them for tonight. My wife's birthday, you know. Well, maybe an hour and a half. How's that? Three dozen. Meet you here. Oh, look, Mac. Uh, maybe we're both heading the same direction. Can we go with you and pick up the nylon? Save time for all of us. Uh, no, I don't think so. No. I can't you wait? An hour and a half? How's that? Never find a better buy. I'm sorry, Mac. I wish we had the time. Well, where do you have to go to pick up these nylons? Oh, way out. Sunset Boulevard near Fairfax. Can't you wait? I'll make it fast. Well, can't we pay you and then go out and pick them up ourselves? Huh? No. Don't work that way. No. Can't you wait here? I'll make it fast. 
Well, we ought to be home now, Joe. Yeah, sorry, mister. We'll have to skip it. Yeah, maybe we can pick up something on the way home, Ben. Candy or something. Wife likes candy. Now, uh, look, fellas, I I don't want to see you lose out on this deal. I'll meet you halfway. How do you mean? Uh, look, together we'll go out to Sunset and Fairfax, huh? Near the place. You wait there at the hamburger stand. And in five minutes, I'll bring you the stuff, okay? Oh, I don't know. We're late already, but... All right, it's a deal. I'll call the wife and tell her we're going to be a little later. Three dozen, is that right? Three dozen of the best. You can't do better. All right, I'll be back in just a minute. Three. Chief of Detectives Office, Chandler. Mike, Joe Friday, Backstrand there? Out right now, Joe. Well, then do me a favor, Chandler. Make it fast. Get a couple of men out to Sunset and Fairfax as fast as you can. Tell them to watch for Ben and me. You got that? Yeah, what else? We'll drive up in our car with another man. Ben and I will get out of the car and go in the hamburger stand. The other man will walk off. Whoever you get, tell him to follow that man. You got it? Right. All right. Just tail him. See where he goes, see what he does. Okay, Joe, right away. All set, Joe? She got dinner ready? Yeah, just about. We better hustle. Sure. Best deal in the world. Let's go. At five minutes to six, we pulled up at the corner of Sunset Boulevard in Fairfax. It was almost dark. Ben and I got out of the car and started over for the hamburger stand on the corner. We caught a glimpse of Barcy and Kaplan in one of our detective cars parked in the gas station on the opposite corner. They had their eyes on our man. When the traffic signals changed, the man crossed the street and headed down Fairfax. Barcy and Kaplan waited a minute, and then they took off after him. He turned at the next corner and disappeared from sight. Ben and I ordered a cup of coffee, and we sat down to wait. At half past six, we were still waiting. At five minutes to seven, I went across the street to the drugstore and called the office. Barcy and Kaplan hadn't been heard from. Their car, 105K, was not acknowledging calls. I had my call switched from communications to Backstrand's office. Well, they lost him, Friday. I don't know how they lost him, but they lost him. Well, who's out there now? Sullivan and Whitney took a detail out there. They're combing the neighborhood right now. Well, how did it happen? A man just doesn't disappear into thin air. That's what I keep telling you about that stuff that's been hijacked. The search for the nylon salesman went on all that night and most of the next day. From his description, we ran a make on him. No previous record. He had disappeared completely. We were right back where we'd started from. The only thing we could do was to start backtracking, re-questioning the people at General Warehouse, the truck drivers, the shipping clerks. We kept a close check on Garfield and Morris, and and we went back to the only possible lead still remaining, Mrs. Laval. She could tell us nothing more than we already knew. When we left her, we started on the neighbors for the second time around. For the rest of the day, we canvassed the immediate neighborhood. We got as many opinions of the Lavals as they had neighbors. At 3.30 that afternoon, we visited with Miss Gertrude Langster, a 50-year-old maiden lady who lived almost directly across the street from the Laval house. She'd been out of town the first time we covered the neighborhood. The old saying goes, Sergeant, there's no fool like an old fool. Oh, say, if I told you the chances I had when I was a girl... Yeah, but we just... Oh, not I... truck drivers like that. Laval man, God rest his soul. But fine, wealthy men, bankers, well, we... lawyers... Templeton Grant, you remember him? No, ma'am. I was engaged to him once. Mm. Butterfly waist. That's what he used to call me. Well, well, I was slim in those days. Would you like to see some pictures of me as a girl? No, no, thank you, ma'am. We'd just like to ask you a few questions, that's all. Could you tell us if the Lavals had many visitors to their house in the past six months or so? Oh, my, no. Funniest thing, I am the nosy type, Sergeant. I like to know everything that goes on around my neighborhood. And you can take my word for it, the Lavals never had visitors. You know, Sergeant Friday, you remind me of a young man I used to be engaged to just a few years ago. Yes, Miss so... Langston. Now, would you tell us, please, uh, did you have any reason to think that there was something little out of the ordinary about the Laval? Oh, little out of the ordinary, he says. But my dear man, yes. Here he was, a truck driver, and there she was with a home furnished life by Astor's. Why, well, I even used to see him cart some of the things home in that car. His beautiful things, rugs and glassware, bolts of fabric. Oh, gorgeous. And he'd bring these things home after work. Is that it, Miss oh, Langston? Any time, any time. Day or night, weekends, any time. Mm-hmm. After four, Joe, we better call the office. Yeah. Now, are you sure of all that you've told us, Miss Langston? Sure. Oh, my dear man, of course I'm sure I watched him week after week. Well, thank well, you. Uh, won't you stay for a cup of tea? I'll have Josephine fix it. Josephine? Uh, no, thank you, ma'am. Well, then, uh, perhaps a glass of sherry? Thank you, no. But there is something. Yes? I wonder if we could use your phone, please. Oh, uh, yes. 
In the hall, next to the umbrella stand. Thank you, ma'am. Two five two three. Two five two three. Thanks, Trent. Friday, Ed. Nothing much here. Well, there's something here. Barcy and Kaplan just called. Pete Garfield left his house half an hour ago. Then he picked up Morris. What's so unusual about that? Nothing except the guy driving the car is the little man in the gray suit, the nylon salesman. Barcy and Kaplan are tailing him. Where are they now? Headed north off Riverside Drive. There's nothing out there but a golf course and a lot of riding stables. I don't care what they do for recreation. Go get them. With red light and siren, it took us 12 minutes to pick up Barcy and Kaplan on Riverside Drive. At 4.23 p.m., we pulled up in front of the Blue Pony Riding Stables. Barcy and Kaplan's car was overturned just beyond the driveway leading up to the Riding Academy. Kaplan's hurt. I called an ambulance. They rammed us. What kind of a car are they in? They switched. They're driving a 12-ton bulldog semi. Which way'd they head? Going north. Got a three-minute lead on you. Pneumatic commercial. Adam 653. Let's go, Ben. Can you see him, Joe? No, not yet. Watch that crossing. Up ahead, Joe. That's a semi. Can you read it? Wait a minute. Adam 653. That's them. Took a ride on Lancashire. Don't lose them. They're pushing that semi too hard. Look at that trailer sway. They'll have to stay on Lancashire. They're going too fast to turn now. Traffic's closing in up ahead of them. They better not turn. That's what they're doing. Look at that trailer whip. They're going over. Into that star first. Banged up, but they're alive. Well, there they are, Joe. Yeah. Garfield, Morris, little man in the gray suit. It's funny, isn't it? What's that? Garfield's going to swear we pushed that truck through that window. The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Peter Garfield, Jack Morris, and John Dolfo, the stocking salesman, were hospitalized and later brought to trial. They were convicted on charges of grand theft and received sentences as prescribed by law. They are now serving their terms in the state penitentiary. You have just heard the 18th in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of acting chief of police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to motorcycle officer Elmer Forsman of the Fresno, California Police Department, who on the afternoon of October 6, 1946, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Remember, starting next Thursday night, October 6, Fatima Cigarettes invite you to listen to Dragnet immediately following the Supper Club. That's 10.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time over most of these same NBC stations. Check your newspaper for local release time. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. Judy Canova joins the star lineup of Saturday shows tonight on NBC. My name's Jeff Reed. I get ten a day in expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Lion. Anthony J. Lion. They call me the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb as Jeff Regan investigator, stand by for hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of The House by the Sea. This is the way it started. I walked in the office about 11 o'clock that morning. It was a nice warm day, and I didn't have much on my mind. That's the trouble with nice days. You take a couple of easy breaths, open somebody's door, and it's just like peeling a wrapper off an atomic bomb. The lion was in his den, sitting behind his desk. He couldn't tell where he left off, and the desk began. He was talking to a girl with a flock of black hair. 
He was the kind you see driving a Cadillac convertible down Sunset Boulevard on a hot Sunday afternoon. No wonder the lion's cigar was out. It was wet on both ends. Well, well, come in, Regan, come in. I was just about to call you, but now that you're here, it makes things simpler. Miss Carmen, this is Mr. Regan. How do you do, Mr. Regan? Mr. Lyon tells me you're just the man I want. You said the same thing to a mortician last week. He is the man I want, Mr. Lyon. Well, well, that's fine, Miss Carmen. I knew you'd be pleased. I'm very proud of Jeffrey. As long as I'm in the cast, how about a look at the script, huh? Miss Carmen is associated with the famous psychic consultant, Prince Cairo. I help the prince look into people's minds. Well, that ought to be real fun if all your customers are under six. <laughs> you don't believe in thought transference, Mr. Regan. Do you? I said I helped the prince. <clears throat> uh, prince Cairo sent Miss Carmen to retain an operator, Jeffrey. It's a very delicate matter, and I'm placing the entire case in your hands. Why didn't he come himself? Do you disapprove of me? I just want to know what's what. Prince Cairo never appears in public. He prefers to spend his time in meditation and thought. Yeah. I handle all of his outside contacts. So, Jeffrey, you just drive on out to Prince Cairo's home in Ocean Town with Miss Carmen and speak to the prince. What kind of a retainer did he send? Uh, How much did you get? Now, see here, Regan, we don't discuss finances in front of clients. Oh, stop it, will you? This is another blind spot. You don't know what it's all about. All you know is she waltzed in here with a check, and you'd sell your grandmother to a glue factory for two bucks. How do I know I won't wind up being Apache again? Is there any way I can reassure you? Buy me a battleship. Jeffrey, have I ever involved you in anything that I wouldn't undertake myself? Have I ever knowingly imperiled your life? Yeah. Jeffrey. Come on, lady. What's it all about? You work for the guy. Well, I really don't know. He was excited this morning, called me in, gave me this address, and told me to make arrangements. He must have told you something. He never tells me anything. As you say, I... I just work for him. Well? All right, I'm hired. Good, good. Now, call me, Jeffrey. Call me if you run into any trouble. Well, I asked her how about lunch... She said no. I asked her about dinner. She said something that meant no, so I gave up. You know, it's like that sometimes. The flag's up, the meter's ticking, and you're not getting anywhere. But from a couple of things she told me, I got the idea she was doing more than just helping the prince read minds. Well, his place turned out to be a good hour from downtown Los Angeles, up 101. It was a couple of stories of glass and concrete leaning out over the ocean. It was high and dry and quiet up there. And you got a feeling you should be hearing things and feeling things when you looked down and saw that water banging around the bottom of the cliff. She unlocked the door, and a guy in a white turban and some pants that looked like oversized diapers and a pair of tennis shoes was standing there. He had a big curved knife hanging around his waist, and he put his hand on it when he saw me. Right this way, Mr. Regan. Who's he, the butcher? Oh, that's Telly. He works for the prince. Man servant. He's from India. Yeah, I bet the Indians are glad to get rid of him. <laughs> Tell he's harmless, tongueless, and he doesn't hear. I like you, Mr. Reed. Come in, come in. Ah, uh, Thelma, my dear. You've returned with spoil. Welcome, sir, welcome. Mr. Regan, this is Prince Carew. Regan, ah, uh, the lion's eye. I've heard of you, Mr. Regan. I'm honored. Sit down. That'll be all, Thelma. Charming girl. Hmm? She handled all your outside contacts? Most efficiently. Except, of course, for matters that I must handle personally. What kind of matters? I'm in trouble, Mr. Regan, and I beg your assistance. That's all paid for. Correct. But there's a personal bonus in this for you. Why? Because, sir, I want you to save my life. You look healthy to me. I am healthy, let me assure you. But my life has been threatened. Well, that'd come under police business, wouldn't it? Normally. Uh, didn't Miss Carmen explain that this was a delicate matter? Yeah, she did. Why didn't you call the police? <laughs> I'm hardly in a position to ask the police for assistance, Mr. Regan. It is a delicate matter. Outside it says you're a mind reader, all right? What am I thinking now? That I'm a charlatan, a faker, and that I'm trying to hide something from him. That gets you the cigar. <laughs> it's been a very lucrative arrangement for the most part and very satisfactory. Except, of course, for the annoyance of having my life threatened. Who's the guy? It would be of no consequence if it were a man. It's a lady, Mr. Regan. A very beautiful and lovely creature. And she'd like nothing better than to see my carcass go out with the tide. Why does she want to kill you? A matter of confidence. 
Uh, suffice it to say that she is thoroughly capable of doing just that. How do you know? One, she is erratic, ill-tempered, ruthless. Two, she called me this morning and told me what she intended to do. She's giving you a chance to reach for your gun? To reach for you, Mr. Egan. What do you want me to do? I feel the entire matter could be settled amicably if you were to call on her. Inform her that you are my personal bodyguard and that you are here to protect my life. You think she'd go for that? I'm positive. How long have you been blackmailing her? What? Well, your racket might last six months or a year, but not long enough to pay for a place like this. The answer's blackmailing, huh? Okay, okay, okay. I should have told you. How do you do it? I can slip into a trance. They spell a family secret. Or do I push a buck that way? That's nice. If you want the mines red, I read them. Twenty-five bucks a parade. And shake down. The guy's got to eat. You put the squeeze on her. She's an actress. She was in on a deal at the studios. She wouldn't shake? At first, I just told her I had to have a larger fee. Then they come out with it, cold turkey. And she said she'd blow your head off. Yeah, she's the kind. I went wrong on this one. I'm in a spot. Who is she? Grace Nichols, movie actress. Ever heard of her? Redhead. Makes you want to go home and kick your wife downstairs if you got one. That good? Better. But she means this business about pumping me. And I won't look good dead. All right, where she live? Over in the Palisades. Here's her address. Uh, you going over there now? Yeah. Be careful. She isn't gunning for me. That isn't what I mean. There's a skinny boy there. He's nasty. No callers. Name of Tim Rogers. I'll remember that. I hope you can talk her out of it. I've been sweating. I don't want to shake her down. I just want to get a little sleep at night. I left him sitting there, scratching his bald head under his turban. He looked about as happy as a guy who just ate a Vaseline sandwich. Well, Grace's place was too big for a marble game and too small for football. I think I remember reading something about how she got it from her third husband. There was a big wire fence all around it and a sign every 15 or 20 feet telling you not to trespass. So I parked my car outside the driveway and walked up to the front door. The guy in a chauffeur's uniform was standing there. He looked like a razor blade with arms. He gave me the fish eye and blew smoke in my face and kind of nudged me with his shoulder. Move on, Pilgrim. No handouts here. I came to see Grace Nichols. Yeah. I got business with her. Yeah. So tell her I'm here. Blow. You always like this or did you miss lunch today? I don't know who you are, Pilgrim, but I don't like you. Beat it. I know you. There's something about a guy in a lineup. Yeah? He memorizes real easy. Copper. Investigator. Private or city, I don't care. You all smell the same. This isn't hunting season. You always carry a thirty-eight. Does it show? Maybe you got a broken rib. A real funny guy. I met all kinds of funny guys. Drift. I said I wanted to see her. And I said she wasn't in. All right, I'll tell you once more. I got business with it. So do a couple of hundred other guys. Watchdog? Now you're getting smart. You weren't. What kind of a crack is that? I want to see her, I'm going to see her. Trick I learned a long time ago. Shoot a guy in the knee and he'll never walk straight again. You ever done it? Oh, yeah. That's how I learned. Ow. That's what I learned, baby. Well, I might have to get a new chauffeur. You looking for a job? I already got one, lady. Timmy's going to be awfully upset when he finds out what happened to him. When someone works for me, they have to be perfect. Want his job? They wouldn't let me in. I'll let you in. You, uh, do that kind of thing often? When I have to. I suppose you have a name. It's Regan. I'm a private investigator. All right, Mr. Regan, you've earned a perfectly good chauffeur and bodyguard, and you're in my house. What have we got to talk about? A guy named Kru. The prince? Must we talk about him? He thinks you're dangerous stuff. So do a lot of people. Tell me, Mr. Regan, what do you think? About what? Me. Right now or when I'm a couple of feet away? Right now. Look, remember, I just got here. I know. You must have a first name. What is it? Jeff. Oh, Jeff, we'll get along. It's in the card. Pretty fast deal. I like it this way. Fast. Might be a bum deck. Never mind. Deal. That's the bell. How much time between rounds? Well, you know me better. Hello? Yes? Yes, right here. 
You know a man named Lion, Jeff? Uh-huh. He seems to be roaring. Give it to me. Yeah. Regan, is that you? Well, now, how do you figure it? Now, don't be smart. Who's the dame who answered the phone? Our client's friend. Sounds like she's a friend of yours now, or maybe you have been doing some road work. Did you have something to say, or is this the day you turn scoutmaster? I'm busy. But you can stop being busy, lover. It's all off. Don't tell me you're passing up a fee. I'm passing up nothing. Prince Carroll called me ten minutes ago and told me to forget the whole thing, and that's what I'm telling you. How'd you know I was here? The prince told me, so it's all over. Finished. Forget it. I've already started something. I don't care what you've started. I just remember, you finish it on your own time and expense sheet. Hmm. You look worried, Jeff. Anything I can do? I'm called off. You mean you're out of a job? I got one. Remember, you put my bodyguard out of commission. You owe me something. Well, Tim, boy, he'll come around. I don't want Tim anymore. I want you. Mm. <laughs> I'll get you a drink. We can talk about it. Carew told me that Tim was a pretty good boy. You can fill his shoes. Come here and get your drink. Now, tell me about 9 o'clock tonight. It'll get dark. I got a new dress. I think you'll like it. I probably would. The place above Malibu, we could have dinner, listen to some music. I want to be with you, Jeff. That deal's fast again. I don't care. I don't care. I just decided something, Jeff. I'm going to like being with you. I'm going to like it a lot. Well, she didn't want me to go. But I was thinking about the prince and the way everything looked. I told her I'd see her that night. I was just climbing into my car when Tim Rogers, her ex-number one boy, stepped out from the gate. I waited for him to walk over. Pretty good with your women, Regan. You look lonely, Timmy. Somebody stole your popsicle? Bum joke, Regan. I've been waiting to talk to you. You were so quiet in the house, I didn't want to make any noise. Any better here? You came out champ this afternoon. But you won't even make the prelims next time. You got something to say? Stay away from her. You're shaking. You need a drink. Stay away from her, Regan. I've been with her too long. Known her too long to take the bounce from a two-bit gum heel. Mm, goodbye. I'm not finished yet. That's your version. Now get your foot off that running board, punk, or I'll take it with me. I left him standing in the middle of the driveway. If I'd have waited another minute, he'd have been crying. I stopped off and had some barbecued ribs at a drive-in out on Sunset. It was just getting dark when I got to my place. I had company. It was Velma Carmen, Prince Carew's right-hand man. She was sitting on the edge of my sofa. Her back was as stiff as a filing cabinet, and there was a little ring of white around her lip. She looked like she'd just been measured for a coffin. There was a twenty-five automatic sitting in her lap. I've been waiting for you, Mr. Rick. I asked the janitor to let me in. Yeah? He was very nice about it. I told him I was associated with one of your clients. Yes, I told him I was associated with Ryan Lacan. Did you know that Prince Carol was my husband? Since when? Oh, a long time now, a long time. Not many people know that. Is that what you came here to tell me? No. I... I came to tell you that you don't have to worry anymore. None of us have to worry anymore. You mean you're calling me off the case? That's it. That's exactly it. I'm calling you off the case. Yeah. Well, I've already been called off. My office phoned me when I was over at her house. Nichols? Yeah. Then it was about her? Yeah. Huh. Well, then, we don't have to worry anymore, do we? No. Nope. She's very pretty, isn't she? I've seen her many times. I think she's quite pretty. I, I could hardly blame the prince. I could hardly blame him at all. What are you getting at? Of course, all the others were pretty, too. Where'd you get that gun? bought it for thirty dollars. Let me see it, huh? Oh, yes. I brought it here so I could show it to you. I I, I, I paid thirty dollars for it. I paid thirty dollars. I'd imagine the air would be cleaner in there, don't you? What are you talking about? I mean, it's really very humane, they tell me. It's just like sitting down and never waking up. I read all about it. You just walk in and sit down, and if you don't try to hold your breath, you... You go to sleep, don't you? You've met murderers before, Mr. Regan. Do I make a good murderer? Do I make a good murderer? <laughs> Stop it. Stop it, will you? You trying to tell me you killed him? Oh, Mr. Regan, that's why I came here. I shot him. I walked up behind him and I put the gun close to his back and pulled the trigger. They don't make such a great deal of noise, do they? 
I left him sitting there in his house by the sea, and he looks very much alive. Only, only he isn't alive at all. Now answer me. Now answer me. Do I make a good murderer? Do I make a good murderer? <laughs> Listening to the story of the House by the Sea, tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator. They're still available for qualified nurses. Yes, the Army Nurse Corps Reserve still has commissions available. If you are a graduate registered nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, you may be eligible for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps section of the regular officers' reserve. To find out if you do qualify for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve, apply to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. And now, back to the story of the House by the Sea and Jeff Regan, investigator. Well, after she got through, she settled down to a slow, even kind of a giggle that started somewhere around her shoelaces and didn't get past her knees. It was one of those things that gives you a feeling like somebody's standing in back of you with a red-hot iron ready to press your pants before you get them off. Now, she wasn't going to do any more talking, so I went downstairs and brought back a doctor friend of mine named Sammy Wing. He brought his little black bag with him and gave her a shot or something. And she wilted like last night's orchid and went to sleep on my couch. Sammy began talking. Some playmate. Wish I'd have been here for the party. I had four appendectomies and one broken leg today. Said I'll lie. How is she? You know her better than me. No, she's going to be all right. But she'll wake up in five or six hours. I want some water. And then what? She might ask you what happened, or it might start all over again, whatever it was. By the way, what was it? Well, I found her here when I got home. I should find something like this. She said she killed an ex-client of mine. Oh, maybe I'm lucky at that. What does all the past tense mean? I was called off the case. Oh, nice. It's all clean. No clients to protect. Is there a court someplace? I don't know, Sammy. Call the police. they find out. And then you and me can go out and get a drink. She said she used this gun. Smell it, Sammy. It hasn't been fired. Safety catch is still on. She's pretty and she's nice. And I'll bet she looks like a million bucks in a bathing suit. But if I'd have met her within the last three hours, I'd have run for help. Call the police. Is that professional? This is acute hysteria. The kind that pops off guns and pops off people, and there's a lot of things they can't remember later on. Call the police. What about the gun? What about guns? Call the coroner while you're at it. Tell him to go out there with some DOA forms. He'll use them. Will you stay here with her like it back? Corpse hunt? Just an idea. Hitler had an idea. The odds were against him. You got about as much chance as a three-legged horse in the Kentucky Derby. She's bit somebody, and she's told you about it. I want to make sure. What do they do when a private eye walks in and messes up a nice, clean murder? Sammy, will you stay? Had any bourbon around here? Yeah. Okay, take your time. Maybe both of us will get our pictures in the paper. I left him with a kind of a soft smile on his face like he had some inside information on Tuesday's winner at Del Mar. Well, it was 9.30 by the time I got there, and it was dark enough to give a ghost that creeps. It was different, too. Maybe it was the fog. I used that ring of keys I'd taken from her purse. It smelled dry and funny inside, and it was real quiet, like somebody was waiting for the world to fall apart. I clicked on my flashlight, and I walked down the long hall to his office. He was there, just like she said. There were three holes in the front of his shirt, but it wasn't the laundry's fault. I spotted the thirty-eight on the floor by his hand. I broke it, and three cartridges came out was the right gun for the job. It was pretty messed up. While I was standing there trying to figure Velma Carmen's story, the lights came on. A fat man wearing a sheriff's star was standing by the switch. There was a taller man in a brown overcoat next to him. They both looked like they'd just finished dinner. Scavenger hot, son. You don't talk, Charlie. Mm, ain't much for him to say, is that, Cap? Guess not. Well, son... Oh, it looks like you're going to be calling me names. What do you like best? Killer, murderer, or slayer? The papers use slayer a lot. I don't like any of them. Kind of breezy for a hot boy, ain't you? Mind giving me a name? It's Regan. I'm a private detective. It's Regan. He's a private detective, Kent. Yeah. Got a card or something with you, sir? 
Yeah. Yeah, he's right. For the international. Lion still there? Yeah. Who's that? An old bum I used to know. Regan, why do you go around killing people? The lion will be mad. Look, this is a fix. Now, why do you want to say a thing like that? Somebody tip you? Phone call a little while ago. Huh? Funny kind of a voice, a whisper. Said we'd find a stiff up here, but didn't say we'd find you. You're extra. Look, I just came here to see what it was all about. Same thing we did. Only we come up with a suspect and a corpse. No cop could ask for anything better. Charlie, better call a coroner. Ocean Town's just a small place, Regan. Only me and Charlie around. We borrow from the county when we get something like this. I can find you a real answer in an hour. You let me and Charlie worry about that. You look good enough for the time being. All right, son. Let's go. I had as much chance as an elephant in the tea room, and if those two locked me up and booked me... So I leaned back into his gun and spun around and knocked his wrist down. He pulled the trigger. By that time, I flicked the light switch and was out the door. I didn't run for my car. I cut across the driveway and doubled back up the hill. I could hear him yelling and shooting out in the dark. I hailed a cab about five blocks away, and he took me to the place above Malibu. I found her in a booth with a piano player. She was wearing one of those black strapless things, and it was worrying a couple of ball-headed guys sitting at the bar. You're late, Jeff. We said nine o'clock. I had three drinks all along. You want me to get mad or are you going to catch up? How long you been here? You sound like you're out of the mood. I thought we were going to look at the stars together. How long you been here? It's nine o'clock. What's the matter? I've been working tonight. Well, it's after hours now. Tell me how you like my new dress. It's the right color with the wrong cut for a funeral. I haven't read the obituaries today. It'll be in tomorrow's paper, only it'll make the front page. Have a drink. Let's wait for tomorrow. Your friend was killed tonight. What friend? Kairu. He was no friend of mine. I told you that. So did he. Car smash up, or did he fall off his house? 38. We didn't talk about him this afternoon. Let's not start now. Look, two cops in Ocean Town are kind of crowding me. They think I'm going to take a good picture. Is that why you're late? It's a murder rap, lady. We should have had dinner together. They'll be knocking down your door in the morning. Why, darling? Because you threatened to kill him because he hired me to call you off. Oh, wait a moment, Jeff. We've been having fun up to now. Who told you that? What, you think he sent me over today to sell magazines? I never found out you were called off. I suppose he hired you to scare me. Jeff, we're old friends now. I can tell you a family secret. I know about him blackmailing you. And that puts you ahead of me for the cops. Did you do it? I don't know. Did you? What he told you don't sound right. What does sound right? I went to him one day and put him in a trance. Only I used scotch. Found out what he was doing and how I was doing it, so I turned the tables. It was good, clean fun, but expensive for him. You've been draining him? I thought that's why you came today. That's why I had Tinny around. Well, some of this is beginning to make change. If he was your meal ticket, then you got an alibi. I don't feel like stars anymore, Jeff. Let's go over to my place and talk. On the way over, she didn't have much to say, and I couldn't think of anything. I was all too mixed up. If she'd really been shaking him down, then she figured out. And the girl back in my apartment figured in. Only she had the wrong gun. And then there was a little business that I'd have to explain with the Ocean Town cops. Well, when we turned in the driveway, I stopped figuring. Tim Rogers, the man with the guns, was there standing on the porch. Oh, gorgeous. I've been waiting to see you. You're home late. I thought I fired you. Still tramping with this tramp, huh? I thought you'd be sick of him by now. For once, I'm glad to see you, Tim boy. That sounds cozy, but I don't want to see you. I know where your 38 is. You're wrong. It's her 38. And it's got her prints on it. Jeff, he's making it look bad for me. Ask me. Ask him what he's doing here, will you? Just in for a showdown, Angel. You're tagged for his murder. They'll want you. I fixed it good. I can fix it so you can get away. How? A friend of mine shoving off at Pedro. Four o'clock. To go all over the world. Jeff, if all of this is straight, I'm in a spot. Relax. This guy never did anything right. Tell me how I'm wrong. All right. That tip to the Ocean Town cops was wrong. Trying to pile up a scare on me was wrong. Killing Cairo was wrong. And this clinches it. Yeah? Well, that's where you're twisted, Pilgrim. I got a warrant out for you right now. Plugging a murder suspect is something they'll thank me for. You said her prints were on that gun. They'll find that out in the morning. And how was I to know? Just happened to hear on the radio they were looking for you tonight. I see you, I plug you. Everybody will be sorry, but it'll be manslaughter and suspended. I worked it once in Toledo. What do you say, Angel? Do I plug him and meet you somewhere in two weeks? Let me have a smoke. Let me think it over. Sure. Sure, go ahead. Sure, Angel. The gun's empty now. I carried this for three years. 
I never used it. He deserved to die, didn't he? Didn't he weaken, didn't he? I don't know, lady. You knew him better. Well, it unwound like red thread in the Levi factory. Grace Nichols had been putting the shake on the prints. He got tired of it and called me in and told me his phony story so he'd have a good self-defense angle when he finally got around to shooting her some afternoon. He had Tim planted there to keep me from really seeing her. Oh, it was a nice idea, only I bounced Tim and got inside. And then Tim made a phone call and the lion jerked me before I had a chance to compare notes with her. I guess Tim went kind of crazy seeing how well we got along together and he figured Grace would do anything if she was wanted for murder. So he killed the prince and made her the patsy with those fingerprints. She'd handled the gun before, see. But then I had my caller, Velma Carmen, the prince's wife. She went kind of crazy, too, when she walked in and found him dead. It took three doctors a couple of weeks to tell her what really happened. When I told it all to the lion, he was mad at first, but then he saw Grace Nichols' picture in the paper. He asked just one question. What was I doing at Grace's place all afternoon? I didn't even bother to answer him. Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan with Wilms Herbert as Anthony J. Lyon. It's CBS same time next week for hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Written by E. Jack Newman, produced by Sterling Tracy. The role of Grace Nichols was played by Betty Lou Gerson, David Ellis was Tim Rogers, Lorreen Tuttle was Velma Carmen, and Marvin Miller was Prince Cairo. 29,000 nurses are needed to join the new Army Nurse Corps Officers Reserve. 4,000 of them, if they wish, may choose active duty. All nurses who receive reserve commission will benefit from the opportunity for specialized training offered to them by the Army. The educational opportunities offer the nurse by the Army Medical Department will be of great advantage to her in her work. Don't wait. If you're a registered graduate nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, drop a card now for complete information to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. Original music for this program is by Dick Around. Jeff Regan, investigator, is heard every Saturday at 9.30 over CBS. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. here is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide detail. A vicious killer has taken the life of a 62-year-old woman... Suspicion points in only one direction. The murderer was heartless, cold-blooded. Your job, get him. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. It's the long cigarette that contains an essential ingredient of all the very popular cigarettes, Turkish tobacco. That's why you see the turkey symbols on the attractive golden yellow Fatima package. That's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima doubles and redoubles its smokers. Yes, if you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of long cigarettes. 
Smoke Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Saturday, November 5th. It was foggy in Los Angeles. We were working a day watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 3.35 p.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. This is Friday in Homicide. I'd like to place a call to Mr. Frank Renard in Murphy, Idaho, number 761. Frank Renard, Murphy, Idaho, 761. Yeah, that's right. The call's been cleared with the business office. All right. Uh, you want me to call you back, Sergeant? No, I'll hang on. Okay, I'll place it for you. Long distance, Mr. Frank Renard, Murphy, Idaho, Murphy, 761. Your number, please. Track the call to Madison, 7961. Thank you. The time and charges on the call's completed operator. Radar, Peter? Yes, Murphy, Idaho, rooting and person rate. 26. NAM, PA, Napa. Hi. One six zero. One six zero. Thank you. You're welcome. Through Boise. Boise. I'm calling Napa. Murphy seven six one. Thank you. Keep ringing, 761. They're ringing the number, Sergeant. Okay, thanks. Hello? Mr. Frank Renard, please. Los Angeles calling. Who do you want? Mr. Frank Renard, please. Los Angeles calling. I'm Frank Renard. Go ahead, please. All right, Sergeant, go ahead. Hello? Hello? Uh, Hello, Frank Renard? Yeah, who's this? This is Sergeant Friday, Los Angeles Police Department. I've got an urgent message for you. For me? Well, what's the matter? Well, your wife, Dolores, asked me to call you. Something's happened to your mother. What do you mean? What's happened? Well, I better let your wife tell you. She wants you back in Los Angeles right away. But what's this all about? I can't leave my job now. You better come. Your mother's been murdered. Talk to the skipper, Joe. He's on his way in. That's good. Did you call my husband? Did you? He's flying down from Idaho tonight. Be here in the morning. You tell him about me? The trouble I'm in? I told him his mother was murdered. That's all I told him, Mrs. Renard. What am I going to say to Frank? He always sided in with his mother. He'll never believe me. What can I tell him? Jury can give you more trouble than your husband can. What you going to tell him? Are you stupid or something? How many times do I have to say it? I didn't kill her. I didn't kill her. It's a small room, Mrs. Renard. We can hear you. Sit down, please. I won't sit down. You're not pinning this on me because I didn't do it. Anybody could have killed the old hag, but I didn't. Will you sit down, please? I don't have to take this. I'm no tramp. Keeping me in here asking me questions. I told you all I know. Look, you're in a bad spot. I hope you realize that. I didn't kill her. Ms. Renard, how long have you and your mother-in-law been living together in the house on Chavez Road? Since Frank took the job up in Idaho. About six months. He said it'd be better for me while he was away living with her. Your neighbors told us you didn't get along very well with your mother-in-law. That's right, I didn't. She hated me, I hated her. You used to fight with her, is that right? You hit her. Only a couple of times. She called me dirty names. I hit her. She pulled me by the hair. I hated her like everything. I didn't kill her. Once more, Ms. Renard, would you mind telling us how you spent your time since early this morning, where you went, what you did, everything? 
I told you already everything. Will you tell us again, please? I got up about quarter to nine. I had a cup of coffee and then I got dressed. The old lady was on the back porch doing the washing. What did your mother-in-law do for a living? I told you. She took in washing. After I got dressed, I left the house. About ten minutes after nine, I went downtown to the dentist. He filled a tooth for me. This one here, you can ask him. What time did you leave the dentist's office? About quarter after ten. Maybe twenty after. You can ask him. What'd you do after that? I walked around window shopping. Did you buy anything? Talk to anybody? I told you no. What time did you get home? Half past twelve. I went in the bedroom. The old lady was on the floor. Blood all over. I felt her heart. It wasn't beating. Is that when you got the blood on your dress? Yeah. Now that's all I'm going to say. Three times I told you the same story already. And you still can't account for your time between 10.20 this morning and the time you found the body and called the police at 12.30. I told you. I left the dentist. I went window shopping. Then I walked home. And during that time, you didn't talk to anyone and no one saw you. Lots of people saw me. People on the street downtown. I'm no tramp. I don't talk to everybody. None of your neighbors saw you come home, Miss Renard? Of course they didn't see me. I cut across the back lot up from San Jose Avenue. I came in the back way. The lady who lives next door to you. She says she was in the backyard about noon time. She stayed there till after one o'clock. She didn't see you come in the back way. And she's a liar. She's a dirty liar. You and your husband took out an insurance policy on your mother-in-law last year. Is that right, Miss Renee? Sure it is. What of it? Five thousand dollars? Yeah, so what? You know a man by the name of George Martino? No. You better tell the truth, Miss Renee. All right, so I do. He's a friend of mine. You've been running around with him since your husband's been away. None of your business. I do what I want. Your mother-in-law found out about Martino. That's what you fought about most of the time. Oh, she was crazy. He's a friend of mine, that's all. Are you telling the truth, Miss Renard? Martino's a boyfriend of mine. I told you, that's all. Your mother-in-law found out you were running around with him. She warned you if you didn't shake Martino, she'd write your husband. You said you'd kill her if she did. That's a lie. That's what your mother-in-law told one of the neighbor ladies. I said it just to scare her. One night I was drinking. We had a fight. She was yapping at me all night. I said it just to scare her. But she wrote the letter anyway. And that's what she said. But I didn't kill her. You had the time, the motive, and the opportunity. It wasn't me. I didn't kill her. Interrogation room, Friday. This is Brennan, Joe. Yeah, Bill. Where are you? Santa Monica. Picked up George Martino. <laughs> Ben and I drove Mrs. Renard to Lincoln Heights Jail, fifth floor, and had her booked on suspicion of 187 PC. When we checked back in at the office, Brennan and Wiseman, the other two men on the case with Ben and I, were questioning George Martino in the interrogation room. Ben and I stood by. Martino admitted only two things. He had been running around with Mrs. Renard since her husband left town, and he had heard Mrs. Renard express a desire to do away with her mother-in-law. After the questioning of Martino, Sergeant Brennan, Ben and I met with Chief Ed Backstrand. It was 5.15 p.m. You got everything but the murder weapon, huh? That and Mrs. Renard's confession. She ought to come through, huh, Joe? I don't know. She's scared, but she's still got a smart mouth. What about Martino, Brennan? You think he had a hand in it? I don't think so. We spent most of the afternoon talking to him. He hasn't got the guts. We took a statement. And does he have an alibi? Solid. What was the cause of death? Strangulation, multiple fractures of the skull. All the motives are with Mrs. Renard, Chief. Pretty clear-cut job. No evidence of robbery or burglary, I guess. A couple of the dresser drawers in her bedroom were emptied on the floor and clothes tossed all around. Pretty obvious plan to make it look like burglary. Maybe. We found three one-dollar bills in plain sight. They were on the floor near the body. If a burglar went through this stuff, he wouldn't have missed that money. And uh, it shouldn't be too much trouble tying it up. Shouldn't be, Skipper. Uh, Friday and Romero, you follow the case through. Fra- oh, just a minute. Hello, Backstrand. Yeah? What? All right, I'll send him over. Lee Jones. Just finished checking the evidence at the crime lab. Yeah? He thinks Mrs. Renard's innocent. There they are, fellas. Facts don't lie. But she had every reason in the world to kill the old lady. In my book, she couldn't have killed her. All right, let's have it, Lee. How does the evidence add up? That's just it, Joe. It doesn't. Take a look. Right. The dress Mrs. Renard was wearing when she found the body. That's it. Blood smears near the hem. Two smears, that's all. Now, if she murdered her mother-in-law, there should be more blood on this dress. It shouldn't be smeared. How do you mean? First of all, the manner in which the old lady was killed. Head was battered in. Must have bled profusely. No question about that. All right, go ahead. Whoever murdered the old lady must have stains all over their clothes. Here's the important part. 
because of the nature of the wound, it would have stained in drops, not smears. Well, how can you tell the difference? Maybe these are drop stains on her desk. They're not. I checked them with the microscope. Only the higher ribs of the cloth are stained. The smears, nothing else. But a drop forms its own definite drop pattern and permeates the cloth, soaks in. Mm -hmm. No signs of that on her dress. Not a one. Now, here's the silk scarf the old lady was strangled with. Yeah. Here's what I found in the knot tied in the scarf. A blonde hair, wavy. Old lady had dark hair. So does Miss Renoy. So does her boyfriend. That's what I mean. This blonde hair is one of two things that didn't belong at that murder seat. What else you got? This hair. Where is it, Lee? Small piece of plastic. A gun butt, I'd say. See here? Mm-hmm. Crisscross surface and a little smooth area here. Yeah. The killer could have hit the old lady with the butt of a gun. And a piece of the stock could have chipped off like this, huh? Miss Renoy doesn't own a gun. He did her murder no. Well, where does that leave us? I don't know, Joe. There's the stuff. You can't disregard it. Maybe you can explain it. Yeah. How? Well, first prove this dress isn't the one Mrs. Renard was wearing this morning. Then find the dress she did wear. We know she wore this one. The dentist identified it, and so did two of the neighbors. That's what I mean. The dress is too clean. Doesn't belong. Yeah. And this blonde hair, this piece of gun butt, they don't belong either. Well, then you think she's innocent. You're looking at the evidence. What do you think? <laughs> 6 p.m. Saturday, November 5th. Ben and I went back to the office and met with Brennan, Wiseman, and Ed Backstrand. The open and shut case against Mrs. Renard was up in the air, but we still weren't sure that she was innocent of the murder of her mother-in-law. Ben and I drove to the Lincoln Heights jail and interviewed the suspect again. She agreed to submit to a lie detector test. We drove back to the office, contacted Sergeant Berger, the department's polygraph man, and set up a special test for the following day. The next morning, we met with Berger and formulated a list of key questions. And then we picked up Mrs. Renard and brought her to the third floor of the old city jail building, the polygraph room. At 10.33 a.m., the test got underway. As usual, Sergeant Berger conducted the interview alone. Backstrand, Ben, and I waited outside. Well, um, how about Mrs. Renard's husband? Getting down yet? He's doing around noon, Skipper. Uh, uh, got a smoke? Yeah. Here you are, Ed. What'd you get? I can study the chart a little more. The results are pretty well defined, though. How's it look? No reaction to the key questions. What's your opinion? I don't think she did it. You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. And in leading magazines this week, you'll see this authentic story. Headline... Fatima's sensational growth sets a record for long cigarettes. Then you'll read the actual reason smokers give for changing to Fatima. Fatima is different. It's mild and has a wonderful flavor. Fatima's best. These are the words of Miss Pamela Bookman of New York, where Fatima has increased its smokers 132%. Fatima tastes much better than any other long cigarette. It's the best. Says Mr. James S. Winterhalter of Detroit, where Fatima smokers have increased 348%. I like the flavor, and Fatima is mild. It's the best long cigarette. That's the statement of Mrs. Mary C. Werdeman of Los Angeles, where Fatima has increased its smokers 545%. Yes, more and more long cigarette smokers every day agree. A change to Fatima is a change to the best. Enjoy Fatima yourself. Best of long cigarettes. Eight AM Monday, November seventh. Mrs. Renard was released from custody. We questioned her husband, Frank Renard, briefly. He could tell us nothing more than we already knew. Brennan and Wiseman were called back on the case, and together the four of us started over again from the beginning. We had a dead body. Two pieces of physical evidence to work with. No idea how to fit them together. And no suspects. We went back to the Chavez Road neighborhood where the murdered woman lived and started pushing doorbells. We canvassed the neighborhood for three days and we uncovered one slim lead. He was selling magazines, officer. Went door to door, right up the street here. Young fellow. Could you describe the man for us, please? Nothing to talk about. Pasty face, pimply complexion, blonde hair. <laughs> 5.30 p.m. Wednesday, November the 9th. Ben and I met with Brennan and Wiseman in Ed Backstrand's office to compare notes. Together, we had more than a dozen reports of the magazine salesman's presence in the neighborhood just prior to the murder of Mrs. Renard's mother-in-law. 
The various descriptions of the man which we obtained from the people in the neighborhood tallied closely. About six feet, 170 pounds, pimply complexion, blonde hair, fast talk him. About 25 years old. As far as we know, Skipper, he was the only stranger in the neighborhood last Saturday morning. Only one that people remember, anyway. How close did you trace him to the Renard house? You got your list there, Brennan? Yeah. There you are. Thanks. Let's see. Well, he picked up his tracks down on Floresta Street, sold a couple of descriptions there, then he headed up Landers Avenue onto Chavez Road. Yeah. The Renards live at 2280 Chavez Road. That salesman talked to the woman at 2274 Chavez. That's three doors away from the Renards. Uh, when was he seen then? Oh, let me see. Where is that, Brennan? Oh, on the 15-7 sheet, Joe. Didn't have enough room on the report. Oh, yeah. Here it is. This is John Rico, 2274 Chavez. The guy was there about 1145 Saturday morning. Well, that puts him in the running. First time he ever showed in that neighborhood? First time, Skipper. Fresh kid, not a very good salesman. Here's the name of the company he's working for, the Harrison News Distributors. You check with them? No, they're closed for the night. We'll call them the first thing tomorrow. Good. Here's something else for you. I had a call from Frank Renard this afternoon. What he had to say? Seems in the excitement just after the murder, Mrs. Renard overlooked a couple of things. What's that? Well, they're missing a yellow table model radio. Radio. It was in the bedroom where the old lady was killed. Yeah, well, that ties in with the robbery motive, huh? Yeah, they're missing a ring, too. Belonged to Mrs. Renard. Topaz ring. It's supposed to be worth a little money. But she didn't notice it was gone until today. That's right. You got the serial number on the radio? Yeah, right here. Okay, yeah, let's see. Yeah, Ben, here we are. It's Emerson model 511-180,000-277609. A lot of small radios in town. There's only one with that serial number on it. Track it down. <laughs> A complete description of the topaz ring and the serial numbers and description of the yellow table model radio were sent to the pawn shop detail. The information was then placed on the stolen property list and relayed to every pawn shop operator in the city. The next morning, Ben and I interviewed the manager of the Harrison News Distributing Company. There, the suspect had given his name as Sam Bricker. We checked out his home address. It turned out to be a gas station in North Hollywood. We took the suspect's job application blank with a specimen of his handwriting and then we drove back to the office. Sam Bricker... We were unable to get a make on the name from the record bureau. We checked the cards and every known criminal who was cataloged in the oddity file as having a pimply complexion. None of them matched. That night, we got out an APB and a radiogram. The suspect's trail led from one salesman's job to the next. On his last job, he gave his name as Albert Berry. His address is 1430 Palo Alto Drive. That was in the Echo Lake District. Ben and I drove out to check it. 1428. 1430. There it is, Joe. Yeah. At least it's not a gas station, huh? Come on. Tiresome, huh? Yeah, I could stand a change. Yes, what is it? We're looking for an Albert Barry, ma'am. Does he live here? Mr. Barry, I'm sorry. He and his wife moved four days ago. We identified ourselves as police officers and had the landlady, a Mrs. Catherine Hoffman, show us the apartment which Barry and his wife had occupied. It was still vacant. In one of the closets in the apartment, we found a cheap overnight bag. The lock on it was broken and one of the seams had ripped. I forgot about that old bag and Mr. Barry told me I could throw it away. Take a look. I'm in. How long has Barry been married? Do you know, Mrs. Hoffman? No, I don't. But the way they acted, lovey-dovey all the time, I don't think they've been together long. Hey, Joe. Hmm? Look, some kind of an identification tag. Yeah, let me see. Get it up here. It's a tool disc. It looks like done. Jameson Larrabee, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You're not after Mr. Barry, are you, officer? Yes, yes. ma'am, we are. Did he leave a forwarding address? I wish he did. I'm holding three letters for Mrs. Barry in my apartment right now. May we see them, please? Certainly. Would you step this way, please? My apartment's just across the hall. Yes, ma'am. Would you like a bottle of beer or something? No, ma'am, thanks. See, I thought I... Yes, here they are. Three of them, Sergeant. From her folks, I think. Mrs. Berry's from Fresno. Oh, that's good. I want to copy down this return address, ma'am. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. That's C.K. Ulrich, U-L-R-I-C-K. Mm. 525 North Lamona, Fresno. Yeah, go ahead. There you are, Miss Hoffman. By the way, did the Berry say they'd call for their mail? Mrs. Berry did. That's why I'm holding on to it. All right. Just one more question. Do you remember if Mr. and Mrs. Berry had a radio? Yes, they did. A small one. Do you remember what brand it was? No, I don't. It had a yellow case. That's all I remember. Before we left, we called Ed Backstrand, and he had an immediate stakeout placed at the apartment house in case the Berries returned to pick up their mail. 
Ben and I went back to the office and placed a call to the Pittsburgh Police Department. We gave them the description and the number of the tool disc which we'd found in Barry's old suitcase. They said they'd check with the Jameson Larrabee Company in the morning and then they'd call us back. That night, Ben and I drove to Fresno and checked in at the police station up there. Two officers were assigned to stake out the Ulrich home. We interviewed Mr. Ulrich, who identified himself as Albert Barry's father-in-law. He told us his daughter had married the murder suspect eight months before, and he gave us pictures of Barry taken at the wedding. Ulrich told us that he'd catch a Santa Fe train out of Fresno the next morning. He wanted to be in Los Angeles to take his daughter home when Barry was apprehended. It was almost 2 a.m. when Ben and I left Fresno and started back for Los Angeles. We checked in at the office at 10 minutes past 8 the next morning. At 8.35, the call came through from the Pittsburgh Police Department. What did they say, Joe? It was a tool disc, all right. James and Larrabee Company issued 18 months ago to one of their workers. Can I give a name? Albert Barry. 11 a.m. Monday, December the 5th. One month to the day since the 62-year-old woman had been beaten to death. The pictures of Barry and his wife, which had been taken at their wedding, were printed up in wholesale lots and distributed to all points. Mr. Ulrich, Barry's father-in-law, arrived in town and got himself a hotel room. We waited. There was no report from the stakeout at the apartment house. We checked back in at the office at five minutes to one. I'll get it. Homicide, Friday. This is Mr. Ulrich, Sergeant. I just got a call from my wife in Fresno. I thought you'd want to know. What's that? The wife got a letter from Norma. They're living in South Pasadena, an apartment. You got the address there? Yes, sir. That's what the wife called about. It's 134 Norway Terrace. When was the letter mailed, do you know? Wife said it was postmarked December 3rd, day before yesterday. Get your coat on, Ulrich. We'll be right over. Ben and I picked up Mr. Ulrich at his hotel and drove to the South Pasadena address. Barry and his wife had the apartment on the top floor. Neither of them were at home. The landlord let us in with a pass key. In the bedroom, we found a small yellow radio. We checked the serial numbers. They matched. It was the same radio stolen from the Renard house. In the bedroom closet, we found two suitcases. We checked through them. Well, nothing in this one, Joe. Here we are. Look at these. What are they, Sergeant? A pair of plastic gun butts. Let's see, Joe. One of them's been chipped, see? Sergeant. Hmm? Somebody coming up the stairs. All right, let's get in the living room. Be quiet. Norma. They want Albert. He killed a woman. It's all right, Norma. It'll be all right. Did you know your husband killed a woman, Miss Barry? He just told me last Saturday. We've been running away for a month now. Moving all the time. I wanted to know why. He told me. He said I was in it as much as he was. And I'm tired of running. <laughs> Why did he kill her? Did he tell you that? He said he broke in the house. He didn't know anyone was home. The old woman was in the bedroom. She started to cry out. He had a gun. He hit her with it. Where's your husband now? I don't know. He said he'd come home for dinner. About five. I bought the groceries. What time you got, Ben? Uh, half past three. Um, that ring you're wearing, Miss Barry. Did your husband give you that? Yes, why? What kind of a stone is that? Topaz. Bert gave it to me. Why? Nothing. We'll wait. Five o'clock came and went. Barry failed to show. Five thirty. Ulrich started to get nervous. Six o'clock. Six thirty. No sign of Barry. I went to the window and kept an eye on the street below. At six forty-five, a light green Nash sedan pulled to a stop in front of the apartment house. A man got out and went into the main floor entrance. Bert. I'll let him in. All right. How long have you had the new car? A couple of days. Bert got it credit. What do you want me to do now? Does he have a key to the apartment here? He lost it. Okay, when he rings, let him in. Just act natural. Ben? Yeah, yeah. You cover me. I'll get the cuffs on him. Right. Hi, Bert. Look out, 
Watch out! All right, drop it, Barry. Okay, Ben. Yeah, he's fast with a gun. Nice looking, isn't he, Sarge? You'd never think he'd kill anybody. Come on, let's take him in. I love him. I still love him. <laughs> but you're a cop, you wouldn't understand. That's right, I wouldn't understand. I'm a cop. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed. To protect the innocent. On February 16th, 1947, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 82, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Earlier tonight, you heard the reports of amazing increases in Fatima smokers from New York to Los Angeles. Yes, all over the country, Fatima is doubling and redoubling its sales. And here's reason one. Fatima is the long cigarette that contains an essential ingredient of all the very popular cigarettes, Turkish tobacco. Reason two, Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Reason three, to millions of smokers, the name Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. Smoke Fatima, the best of all long cigarettes. <laughs> Albert Ralph Berry was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. His wife, Norma Berry, was found innocent of the charge that she harbored a criminal. She was returned home with her father. Berry was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary. You have just heard Dragnet, a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of acting chief of police, W.A. Wharton... Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Private Hubert W. Estes of the District of Columbia Metropolitan Police Department, who on the night of May 16th, 1947, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. <laughs> Fatima Cigarettes, best of long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, portion transcribed from Los Angeles. Be sure to hear songs by Morton Downey tonight on NBC. George Lupo. He's a fat, friendly little guy who wouldn't harm a fly. There's no money in harming flies. We start every night about ten and play till the customers get that first frightening look at each other in the early light. Lupo's working on a scheme to push the dawn back for at least one more hour. I don't think he'll make it, but I wouldn't want to risk a buck against him. 
But last night everything was routine until I saw her again. We were just winding up the third set when she came in, flanked with the same deadpan gunsel. She sat alone at the same table, ordered the same drinks, smoked the same Egyptian deities, gave me that same loving look. The gunsel, as usual, nibbled at his drink at the bar and his eye playing watchdog for the girl. This was the fifth night, four nights running, same girl, same gunsel, same routine. Sit for five solid hours, drink, smoke, and work me over with her eyes, reach down deep for a sigh, and leave with deadpan right behind her. Well, I didn't like it. I was beginning to taste salt on my tongue. We went into a finish, and the girl looked once at the gun, so he nodded, left the bar, and started to the stand. All right. Nick, can you push it a little? It helps when we can hear the beat. Right. Don't audition for me. Just do it, huh? Beat. Hey. Yeah, Red. That babe's here again. I know, I know. All right, what do we got up next? Working up ahead of steam, Pete. Well, she's beginning to make me feel like a wayside shrine. You. Who? You. Me? Yeah. Oh, you got a request? The number you'd like? No, I got no request, but the lady, she's got a request. The lady? What's the matter? You don't see the lady? How come you don't see the lady when she's looking right at you? Oh, that lady, yeah, sure, I see the lady. Why do you make like you don't see the lady when all the time you know the lady's looking right at you? Look, friend, I'm only a poor underpaid employee in this trap. Now, my contract says I'm to play music to please the patrons. I'd be very happy to do anything the lady likes to please the lady. So, all right. So what does she want me to do? So she wants you to have a drink with her. Sure, that'd be an honor. But I'm afraid that Mr. Lupo, he's my boss, you know. George Lupo, the proprietor, he doesn't like his employees to mingle with I will with talk you. to Lupo. He'll like it. Yeah, you could probably make him love it. Come on, I'll be right back, Red. Use some nickels. Right, Petey. Vita, this is Mr. Kelly. Mr. Kelly, this is Vita Brand. Sit down, Mr. Kelly. Yeah, thanks. All right now, Vita. You happy? I'm getting happier by the minute. Sure, you You want me to go back to the bar? But here it's more friendly. Hello, Pete. Hello, Miss Brand. Vita. Vita. You like my name? Sure, sure. It's beautiful. Vita. I only just got it last week. I'll take a little time to break it in. Let me hear you say it. Vita. Yeah. I like the way you say it. Like you mean it. Yeah, I do. I never met anything more in my life. That's because you're sincere. I knew you were sincere the first time I looked at you. Remember the first night I came in? Back here and looked at you. Yeah, well, I'm pretty busy up there, you know. Ain't slipped a link since that night. Well, maybe if you go home and put your mind to it, huh? It's no use, Pete. I tried. Nothing's any good. Nothing I can do is going to change it. Change what? The way I feel. Sick? Yeah. With what? With love. Oh, poor Rita. Yeah, well, beautiful girl like you. No trouble finding another man. I don't want another man. You don't want another man. I want you. That's what Vita wants you. I love you, Pete. Yeah, sure. Well, that's the way it ought to be. Everybody love everybody else. It's a better world. Well, I got a number to do. Uh... <laughs> and you shut up. The lady is trying to tell you how much she loves you, so pay attention. Yeah. First time I saw you, Pete, hit me like a dumb dumb bullet. Well, excuse me. I have to earn a buck. Frame it. It's the last one you'll have to earn. All right. Let's do one. What do you got up? Deal with me again. All right. Pete. Yeah, Red. That babe, I got the rumble on her from Lupo. Yeah. Ever hear of a citizen named Bacalini? The three for boy, three killings for the price of two. All right, Red, funnel it down, huh? She belongs to Bacalini's loser, Petey, loser. And then you told me what, now tell me how. Well, let's try one. Let's do it when we meet again. All right, we'll make a slow intro out of the last eight. We'll go back to the top, Nick. You take the first four going in. Everybody got it? Okay. All right. Let's try it. Come on, let's all play it, huh? All right, once more. Nervous, Petey? No, I'm not nervous. Now, come on, everybody, once more.
break. Pete, Gunsel's heading this way again. Yeah, I know. What do we got up next? Bruce, we live you in his ditch in one All right. Now, look, friend, I got a job Bill to do. Bill Conant, let's go. Where? Now, you listen, Buster. This ain't a lollipop poking you in the gut. I could drop you and be out of here before you hit the floor. Yeah, let's go. Well, we went outside. With the spano out in front probably wasn't as long as it looked. We've got fairly short blocks in this part of town. Vita took the wheel. She banked low around the corner, pulled out of a half woman, gained a little altitude, and flew blind for downtown Kansas City. Vita glanced at me from the corners of charged eyes. It just glanced at me. I leaned my head back and closed my eyes. The Hispano whipped down Main Street, lost altitude as we gained the deserted financial district, made a perfect no-point landing at the side entrance of the Grundy Bank and Savings. But we went into the bank through the family entrance. One light was burning, and it hung low over the biggest dice table I ever saw in any bank. The stick man was busier than a flea on a fat lady. He called the plays and called the points, and not one of the 50 torpedoes glanced at us as we climbed a short flight to an upstairs office. Two men were in the room. One, a shadow dressed in dark clothes, looked through a small window onto the dice game down below. The Tommy gun rested easy across his knees. The other man sat behind a desk no bigger than the loading platform at Union Station. He was counting money. Neat, orderly piles of bills were stacked around him like a well-trimmed hedge. We waited while he finished thumbing a book of fifties. He just held him up to his ear, fanned him once, made a note on a pad by his elbow. Finally, he turned his swivel chair to face us. It was all chin and jaw. He leaned back, made a church steeple with his fingers, drew me a credit manager's smile, and rocked his chair gently to and fro. Well, come in, Mr. Kelly. Sit down. You're among friends. Yeah, thanks. Pete, permit me to introduce you to this here gentleman here who's very fond of you. Sure, everybody loves me tonight. Oh, he doesn't love you. Only I love you. He's really very fond of you. I am back to Yeah. <laughs> he's confused. Ain't he cute? Ain't he cute when he's confused? What confusion? How much time do you have? I'm at your disposal. Oh, uh, look, it runs something like this, Mr. Bacalides. I play cornet, see? At 417, I mind my own business. I try not to poke a thumb in anybody's eye. Well, I noticed this young lady here sitting out front, and tonight she asked me to have a drink with her. Well, naturally, I'm flattered. Yes, yes, I know all this, but what is your confusion? Well, it seems that this young lady here has a... Well, some kind of an idea that she sort of likes me and... Loves you, Mr. Kelly. Yeah, well, loves me like you say. Well, I don't figure myself for no Rudolph Valentino, so I get an idea that it's a rib, you know, and especially since I know how, well, how she, how both of you... Not both. One. Me, I love Vita very much. Oh, darling, you're sweet. Yeah, that's right, for a fact. And when Vita thinks it over, I'm sure she's There's gonna... nothing more to think over, Mr. Kelly. Vita has stopped loving me, all right, I face it. It makes me very unhappy, but I face it. Now she loves you. She wants you. I know how unhappy this can make her. I do not like for Vita to be unhappy, so Vita and me, we talk it over. We decide you will marry Vita. Thank you, darling. You're sweet. There's nothing, Vita. You know how I will do anything to make you happy, anything. All right, now how about doing something to make me a little happy, huh? But I give you Vita. Yeah, well, I pass. You refuse? Oh, Pete, you don't mean that. You've made Vita cry. I do not like to see Vita <laughs> cry. Tell her you do not mean that. Goodbye, friend. I got a number to do at 417, and it ain't here comes the bride. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Pick him up. On your feet. You will ask Vita to be your wife. What's the next best offer? It's don't hurt him. I want. All right, Itch. I think Mr. Kelly wants to say something. Yeah. Kelly. Huh? Who am I? Huh? You hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Whiskey. Drink. Put him in that chair. Come on, boy. Hold his head back. <laughs> All right, he's fine now. Yeah. All I need is a few kind words. I will give them to you. Just repeat after me. Vida, I love you. Vida, I love you. Vida. Vida, I love you. Oh, Pete. Will you marry me? Will you marry me? Oh, darling, of course I will. Congratulations. We drink this. To the happy bride and groom. Long life. Long life. Long life. Yeah. Now, here's how. Tomorrow afternoon, you and Vida will marry in City Hall. It will be best man. Then you go on a nice long honeymoon and drive to Canada in my Hispano, which I give Vita for a wedding present. Look, I got a job here in town, 417 Cherry. Go back to that crib. Tell the boss you quit. Tear up your cornet. I'm loaded, Pete. Loaded. All right. Here's a pound of fifties. Tomorrow morning, you buy some clean clothes, top to bottom, inside and out. You will meet Vita at City Hall, 2 o'clock. Here's a key to the Hispano. Take it. I'll kiss Vita goodnight. Yeah. Good night, Angel. I'll be the happiest bride in the world. Sure. And you'll be the happiest bridegroom. Yeah, the saddest step. Well, I left.
left the office inside the spin of a top. And the Spano stood by the curb, sleek and calm, just like nothing had happened. Nothing at all. So I pointed for the 12th Street Bridge, made the other side of the river, and set a course down Boulder Road for Fat Annie's place. Oh, I tried to imagine life with Vita Brand. And then I thought of six painless ways of committing suicide. And I began to feel better. Fat Annie's place was doing a fair business for the law hours. Maggie Jackson was standing back by the piano. I groped my way to the bar, ordered a bromo and ammonia, and listened. All right, for the wealthy gentleman from Detroit. He needs me. All right, Ray.
right, that'll do. Now, look, boys. I'm not going to be around for a while. A little business i got to take care of. Well, you'll hear from me, so just keep at it right here until... Red? Yeah, see? In the alley, huh? Look, Red, I'm in a jam. What can I do to help you? Thanks, but nothing. i got to keep moving. Maybe cool off in a couple of weeks. Maybe not. Meantime, try to keep the boys together, huh? Sure. Well... Take care of yourself, huh? Easy. Need a couple of bucks, Erskine? Anything? No, I'm fine. I'll see you. Well, it wasn't easy. I was going to miss the boys. I missed Red already. No, no, it wasn't easy. But there was only one exit. I drove around to the rooming house, raced up the stairs. All I had to take was a clean shirt, my other suit, and my book of arrangements. I'd hightail it east, just keep rolling till I ran out of road. That was the plan, until I got to my room. She was stretched across my bed, and she looked right at me as I came in. And there she was, on my bed, looking right at me, but I was all alone. Now, Vita would never be anybody's widow. She was too dead to say I do. The stocking from her left leg was where no girl's stocking ought to be, knotted tightly around her throat. Well, I tiptoed back to the door as though she was a light sleeper. I closed the door very gently behind me, and then I raced down the three flights into the street, into the Hispano, and into high speed. There was no landing out of this one. You just don't hit the road in the car belonging to the stiff you leave behind. For such violations, the law is strict. Also, back of Leedy's. Well, I pulled up hard in front of Sour Sammy's joint. This time, the brakes cried. Barney Ricketts was sitting at his usual table in his usual state, boiled and loud. Barney's the only ex-bootlegger in the country who went broke in 1922. He says he did that to aggravate a couple of prohibition agents he hated. Well, Barney saw me come in and waved me over to his table. Ah, Pete Kelly. Welcome, Petey, and have a drink. Look, Barney, I'm up to my eyes. Nonsense, Petey. You haven't even opened them yet. Ah, here we are. A drink for you and a drink for me. Now, listen, Barney, I'm in trouble. Petey, I have suddenly become oppressed by the state of the world. Well, it's my own fault, Petey, my own fault. I make it a rule never to look at the public prints. But tonight, well, uh, just listen to these few choice items. Now, look, Barney, right now I'm a moving target for Bacalini's gun. Last night's edition of the Star. Look here, Petey, September 8, 1923. Girl forced to leap from strangers' automobile. But let us remember, Petey, that the only girls who leap from strangers' automobiles are those who climb into them. And here, uh, look here. All right, Barney. California politicians say they are responsible for President Calvin Coolidge's Success. Uh, probably insist, Petey, that it's in honor of their state that he's called Cal. And this, Petey... Barney, look, there's a dead girl in my room. Marx quoted at 28 cents per million. So you see, Petey, even a German millionaire is pushed hard to feel like 30 cents. Now, look, Vita Brand, back a lady's girl, she's dead, Barney, in my room. Well, now... That's most careless of you, Peter. If I run, it's the law, Barney. If I stand still, it's Bacalides. How did you get mixed up with Peter Brand and Bacalides? I don't know. I'm still in last week's fog. She wanted to marry me. Bacalides said I would or else. Why, Barney? Why, if he torched for it? Very simple problem in human relationships, Peter. Tonight, the word got out that Muggsy Brand was sprung. Who's Muggsy Brand? Peter's father. He was sent up last year. Peter's his whole life. He tried to guard her like Lupo guards his cash register. He hates Bacalides, and if he learned that he and Peter... Yeah, yeah, now it's coming the focus. Sometimes, Petey, you're dull-witted. Dull-witted, but stupid. So back a lady can beat her rigged it to disarm her old man. She marries me, takes the heat off back a lady. Splendid, Petey, splendid. And her old man winds up throwing a knife at me. All I gotta do now is explain Vita's body in my room to Muggsy Brand. Precisely what back ladies expect you to face. All right. Do the rest of it together for me, will you? Bacalides is married. He could never square himself with Vita. He got in deeper than he wanted to. He couldn't dump her because of Muggsy coming out. So he ties her onto you, gets her up to your room, leaves her dead on your bed. How do I back out of this one, Barney? Do you know where to reach Bacalides? Yeah, at the Grundy Bank. His dice game? Yeah, that's right. All right, go there. See Bacalides, lay it on the line for him. All the way, just like we talked it here. Well, they'll cut me down. You might. How much edge do I have? Not quite enough to shave with. But maybe just enough to cut my throat, huh? It's your only chance, Pete. You're in the middle of a three-way push. The law, back of ladies, Muggsy Brand. All right, Barney. I'm counting on you on the outside. Don't worry, Petey. I'll be there with bells on. Yeah, make sure they don't toll for me. Well, I went back to the Grundy Bank in savings. I had no trouble getting in. The game was just heating up. I stalled around the dark edges of the table for a minute and laid a few bucks on the field. 
Upstairs, the light was on in the office. The boy with the big piece was still sitting at the window. I could see the head and shoulders of Bacalides. He was still counting money. I started slowly up the stairs, went into the room without knocking. The muscle man swung sharp, pointing the heater at my stomach. Bacalides, fast for a big man, flung out a hand and knocked the gun out of line. Hold it. Next time knock, or you pick up a lot of weight. Yeah, or a silk stocking around my neck? No, for you and knife. From the fingers of the best shiv man in the country. Must be brand? Don't try to run, Kelly. He likes a moving target. Just go to him. Tell him his daughter is in your bed, a stocking around her throat. Tell him you don't understand any of it. He will be very sympathetic. Well, that's nice, Mr. Bacalini. You set it up real nice. It's smart, huh? Sure. You persuade Vita to buzz it around that I'm number one. Everything fixed for her father's ears. Even get her to help you push her across by going up to my room. Tell a good story, friend. Maybe too good. I'll put that rod down, Bacalini, before you drop it and break your toe. Maxie, take him downstairs. Come back alone. Peter, hey, look out. Get down. Mumsy. Barney, you all right? Shell shock. Mm-hmm. Muggsy Brand? Yes, Pete. I knew where he was. All he heard was Bacalides. Kelly. Yeah, Muggsy. Bacalides. I got him? He was between the gun. Not much left of him. Or his trigger man. Or me. Now listen. To my Pope. Money. Take it. You might kill a good burial. Easy, Muggsy, huh? She was only a kid. Maybe if she met a guy like... He's done, Pete. Yeah. What do you mean, Pete? A guy like who? Who knows, Barney? Who knows? Transcribe.